I am Devesh Kapoor, uh, Director of Asia Programs. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us at our second annual Korea in Asia Conference, a flagship event of SISE's Korea Studies and Asia Programs in collaboration with the Korea Development School of Public Policy and Management. In, in, in sort of Washington, much of the discussion of Korea's foreign economic relations focuses on the US, China, and, and Japan. However, South Korea's foreign economic relations, both trade and investment, have diversified beyond its three big partners. While maintaining its bilateral relations with the US, the Korean government has pursued a multi-track foreign economic strategy to strengthen economic political and security ties with ASEAN, as well as with other Asian sorry, economies. We launched the event uh, Korea in Asia Conference series last year with two panels that, that looked at South Korea's new Southern pop policy, which aims to strengthen trade and security ties with ASEAN and India. Uh, today, we want to explore how some of these policies are weathering the storms of a more assertive China, the global pandemic crisis, and a questioning, if not retreat, from globalization by the very country that was its biggest champion, namely the United States. And so how will uh, Korea's efforts be further impacted by the Biden presidency? We have two excellent panels to uh, consider these challenges. The first will look at the impact of growing security tensions, the pandemic, and core economic factors on global supply chains, especially within Asia. The second panel will focus on the geostrategic implications of the Biden presidency for Asia. In holding this and other events, we are delighted to join hands with the Korea Development Institute School, uh, KDIS, which uh, very generously supports our Korea Studies program. We will soon enter the third year of our partnership with KDIS, a partnership that has immeasurably benefited the students and intellectual life at SAIS through scholarships and research opportunities. We are delighted to have KDS, KDIS as our partner in Korea. Uh, uh, the Dean Yu of KDIS is unfortunately not able to join us and sends his regrets. However, he has very kindly recorded some remarks like for us, which we will now play. Uh, Dorian? Professor Devish Kapoor, uh, Director of Asia Programs at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to you. On behalf of KDI School of Public Policy and Management, I'm deeply honored to, and pleased to welcome you to the Korea in Asia, the economic effects of geopolitical transformations on Asia conference. I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this uh, very meaningful program today. I want to especially thank Professor Devish Kapoor and the other distinguished speakers here today. Approximately 80% of global trade occurs through global value chains. The phenomenal growth of uh, uh, global value chains related trade has translated into significant economic growth in many countries across the world over the last two decades, uh, fueled by reductions in transportation and communication costs and declining trade barriers. Especially what stands out is the growth of developing countries' participation uh, in global value chains. Uh, developing countries were provided with opportunities to integrate into the global economy as a result of the emergence of global value chains, generating jobs and alleviating poverty in their countries. However, a growing trend in populism and protectionism have instigated trade wars and a backlash against globalization, 
Uh, we're also experiencing uh, lightning speed technological advancements in automation uh, that are changing how goods are being produced and reducing the demand for labor uh, with profound implications for the future of work. All this before COVID-19 even entered our lives uh, this year. Global value chains faced a profound shock with the onslaught of the global pandemic. Following supply disruptions amidst the growing prevalence of nationalism and heightened geopolitics, in particular concerns over US-China trade tensions, COVID-19 has forced companies and countries to rethink the resiliency of global supply chains. Uh, we are likely to see a reconfiguration of uh, GVCs due to COVID-19 in terms of uh, reshoring operations, uh, vertical integration of production lines and strategic supply chains uh, diversification. So what does that mean for Asia? China is a key player in global supply chains as it accounts for a quarter of the world's manufacturing value added and offers a comprehensive supply chain ecosystem that reduces logistical and coordination costs. However, after the panic experience this year, uh, we may see more companies focus on supply chain resilience uh, rather than cost and even maybe quality as diversification becomes a higher priority. Uh, this quest for diversification could open opportunities for other countries in the Asia region uh, to compete in various industries. At the same time, by keeping production lines in the region and close to its biggest customer, uh, that is China, uh, we may see some interesting transformations in the region as it remains relatively advantageous for GVCs. We also soon have a new administration in the United States. Uh, global trade tensions between China and the US are expected to hopefully de-escalate uh, with President-elect Biden's administration and be replaced with more of a framework of competitive coexistence uh, or, or rivalry. We are likely to see a re-engagement by the US with multilateral organizations like uh, the WTO and WHO. Uh, however, Biden administration, which faces monumental challenges as it takes office uh, between COVID-19 and a recession, uh, may not have much political capital uh, because of uh, the Senate situation, which remains to be seen uh, with the runoff elections in January. Uh, changes for the time being regarding the Biden administration's policies for the region may be more uh, uh, in tone than about a real policy change. But what is certain is that we will continue to have challenges as we learn to move on and recover from this pandemic. Uh, if this year has taught us anything, it's that we are resilient despite the overwhelming challenges, but only when we work together. So we are grateful for uh, programs like this, so timely organized by our public diplomacy through education cooperation partner, SAIS, uh, as a venue where we can share our thoughts, knowledge, concerns on our uh, way forward. Before I conclude my remarks, allow me to uh, take this opportunity to, to thank SAIS Asia programs and Korea Studies team for co-hosting this event and helping uh, to put it together. Under the guidance and commitment of Professor Davish Kapoor, SAIS has strengthened the field of Korean studies uh, by enhancing awareness and understanding of Korea-related issues uh, from um, current affairs perspective. Uh, we're truly pleased to have opportunities to collaborate with you and look forward to seeing how this partnership continues to uh, evolve and flourish. Once again, I wish to extend a heartfelt welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us for this very significant event. Thank you. Uh, uh, a very deep uh, 
thanks to, to sort of Dean Yu and his very kind and generous remarks. Uh, I'd like to now introduce the chair of our first panel, uh, Dr. Won Yuk Lim, who is also a professor and associate dean at the Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management. Uh, he's visiting us at SAIS this year and next year has a visiting faculty and we are very grateful to him for this partnership and for for helping us to build this program and this and this uh, conference. So Dr. Lim, the whole world like to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kapoor, for, uh, for that kind introduction. Um, as uh, 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 Professor Kapoor mentioned, we have two panels for uh, this conference or webinar. And first panel will look at the uh, uh, global value chain reconfiguration since the global financial crisis and uh, look to the future. And uh, the second panel, uh, panel two, would look at the broader uh, geoeconomic implications of the new Biden presidency in Asia, covering trade, intellectual property rights, and everything. Now, um, what I'd like to uh, say at the outset for panel one is this. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of uh, loose talk about uh, decoupling, uncoupling, and so on. Uh, but I think it's important to have an empirically informed look at what uh, global value chain re reconfiguration looks like. So uh, uh, I say this because although growing tensions between China and the United States and the disruptions caused by uh, COVID-19 are, are raising apprehensions of uh, uh, disentangling uh, global supply chains from China, uh, uh, but untangling supply chains that have been built up over many years is very complex, uh, difficult, and costly. And as uh, indicated by the recent agreement on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, RCEP, uh, among ASEAN 10 and uh, China, Japan, and Korea, uh, as well as uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, shows, um, uh, economic uh, considerations and geopolitical considerations interact in interesting ways. And it's not a foregone conclusion that we are, you know, uh, about to see uh, the onset of a new Cold War between uh, the United States and China. So for this uh, panel, what I'd like to, um, what I'd like to uh, ask uh, my panelists is to give us some empirically informed uh, perspectives on global value chains. In particular, what have been uh, the trends of global value chain reconfiguration since the outbreak of the global financial crisis? And what have been the main drivers of this reconfiguration? Uh, and how extensive will the coupling be given economic as well as uh, geopolitical factors? And how will this be affected by, as well as drive, uh, China's dual circulation strategy, uh, the strategy of uh, filling in the missing links in its domestic value chains on the one hand, and promoting itself as the uh, indispensable center of uh, global value chains on the other. Uh, also, how will this be affected by and uh, drive different trade agreements, such as RCEP, uh, CPTPP, and others? And uh, as a panel two will get to in more detail, how will the election of um, uh, Joe Biden uh, uh, change uh, geopolitics and thereby the geoeconomics uh, shaping uh, supply chains? So those are, these are some of the questions we will address in this panel. And we have three uh, excellent uh, speakers for this panel. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Vikram Nehru. Uh, Nehru, uh, a distinguished uh, practitioner in residence at SAIS. Our second speaker is uh, Aditya uh, Mathu. Uh, he's uh, the chief economist for East Asia at the World Bank, and he co-led uh, the uh, World, Bank, uh, World Bank's flagship World Development Report 2020 on global value chains. And our last speaker is uh, Dr. Sangun Chang, a fellow at KDI uh, Korea Development Institute uh, in Korea. 
uh, who's really a leading scholar on uh, uh, global value chains in Korea and has done extensive work. So uh, I'd like to first ask uh, Professor Nehru to give his uh, presentation. And at the outset, I'd like to uh, uh, emphasize that each speaker would have 15 to 20 minutes and we'll, some, uh, we'll save some time for discussion, which uh, people, can, uh, uh, people can send in their questions using the uh, Q&A function. And I uh, look forward to a very uh, exciting uh, discussion. So without further ado, Professor Nehru. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin. Um, it's an honor to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, together with my esteemed and very distinguished uh, uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Matu from the World Bank and Dr. Chang from the Korean uh, Development Institute. So I've been asked to provide some very broad brushstrokes on the question of supply chain transformation in Asia. And I'm going to do that without the benefit of a PowerPoint. I basically have just three major propositions to make. Uh, let me make the first proposition which is that since the 1970s, supply chains or global value chains as they're otherwise called, have played a key role in driving globalization, global growth in trade and GDP and the rise of Asia and the global economy. And uh, Professor Yu uh, made these points uh, very forcefully indeed. Now we describe um, value chains as uh, when goods and services cross at least two borders and complex chains when they cross three borders or more, and it is true that since the global financial crisis in 2008, the growth of value chains may have slowed, uh, but they have not stopped growing. Indeed, since the growth, of, the growth of complex value chains indeed have once again started growing since 2017. Of course, this was before the pandemic struck. Now, as Others have just mentioned uh, um, the share of global value chains in total trade. The estimates vary from half to two thirds and some perhaps even more. And it's been turbocharged by the drop in cost for communication and transport, as, as Professor Yu has already mentioned, together with the ease of global financial flows and increased openness to trade and investment, uh, all buttressed of course by the global trading arrangement as overseen by the WTO. Asia has been key to this transformation with China as the hub, especially since its accession to the WTO in 2001. MEs have located there mostly for their assembly operations, taking advantage of China's large market, impressive infrastructure, its openness to trade in FBI, its disciplined labor force. But what they have done is drawn upstream designs created in the advanced economies, production equipment and capital goods. Uh, with uh, the latest technologies from Korea and Japan and components and raw materials drawn from Southeast Asia. So the result has been, has been factory Asia, a complex network of value chains that has made Asia, primarily East Asia, the largest contributor to growth in trade and GDP in the first two decades of this millennium and certainly since the global financial crisis. What's important is that for low-income countries in, in, in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, countries such as Myanmar and Cambodia, regional value chains have allowed them to attract foreign direct investment in manufacturing and kickstart their industrialization process. Now, the highest value-added portions of the supply chain are already designed and marketing. The lowest value-added portions tend to be fabrication and assembly. And high value added design is driven by research coordinated by the advanced economies, Europe, Japan, the United States, to some extent, Korea. And these, and this sort of research has created global giants, or arguably even oligopolies, with significant entry barriers for potential competitors. But the research itself while it may be coordinated from the advanced economies, is increasingly being done in Asia, especially in China and India. And I'll come back to this uh, when I talk about uh, technological decoupling. The market power of these global firms comes mainly from intellectual capital. The smartphones may be difficult to design, uh, but they can eventually be reverse engineered. 
and indeed there are new competitors that are emerging. However, the operating systems on which they operate are dominated by just two firms, Android and Apple. Um, and it is the control of that software that gives those companies significant global market power. And all of these factors are important when discussing uh, the technological decoupling that may be or could take place. But I just want to mention one more thing. That is that high value added marketing is also becoming increasingly globalized thanks to digital technologies. The emergence of platform firms and the critical emergence of network externalities. But here, Asian unicorns are giving global giants a run for their money. Alibaba, Alipay in China, Gojek, Grab, Tokopedia in Indonesia, Paytm, Ola in India. These are challenging huge giants like Amazon, PayPal, and Uber. And emerging as regional, if, I mean, national if not regional giants in their, in their own right. And one of the reasons for the rise of these organizations is because national regulations and suspicion, basically anti-foreign sentiments, have dampened foreign investments in this space. So in conclusion to the first proposition, I, supply chains have been a powerful driver, trade and manufacturing in East Asia, especially in East Asia, in manufacturing, competitiveness, GDP growth, employment, and of course, per capita incomes. So let me come to proposition two, which is the global value chains are being reshaped and will continue to be reshaped by forces from multiple directions. And I emphasize the point of multiple directions because they don't necessarily all work in the same way. The first, as has already been mentioned by Professor Yu and Professor Lim, a broad pushback against globalization in many parts of the world, which is now being joined, which is being addressed by forces for globalization. Then there's the US-China trade war, together with its geopolitical dimensions, and coupled with that, the technology war that is taking place, which in my view will have far greater ramifications. Then we have rising unit labor costs in China, which is triggering structural change within the Chinese economy, the relocation of labor intensive factories to other parts of Asia. And, and then we have the emergence of new trade agreements. We already talked about the CPTPP, the RCEP, which has already been mentioned. And last but not least, of course, the pandemic itself, which has highlighted the need for resilience in value chains in the face of shock. You notice I have taken out, I have not mentioned the issue of technological change, because that is such a big issue, and I think we can always discuss it in the Q&A if people so wish. What's important is to know, of course, that it's difficult, perhaps even futile, to try to disentangle the effects of all these global and regional forces on the future of value chains. That they will shape the future, that, that, that they will shape the future value chain architecture is indisputable, but in which direction is frankly more difficult to discern, discern. Let us consider each of these issues in turn. Let's start with this broad pushback against globalization, right? There is, as Professor Yu mentioned, the shift towards protectionism, which is reflected in the rise of political parties in a broad number of Western countries, right? Uh, and, but the, the important point that I want to mention is that what, what this has led to is also a rise in pro-globalization forces, the leaders in Japan, Korea, New Zealand, and some European economies, such as France and Germany, have pushed back against anti-globalization sentiments. Arguably, you know, British polls even now indicate that if, that if the vote for Brexit would be held again today, then the Remainers uh, would, would, would win. <clears throat> Perhaps most importantly, East Asia's developing economies those that have benefited so greatly from globalization remain strongly in favor of continuing openness to trade and FDI, although clearly there are different degrees of support. Let me come to the US-China trade war, which, is often, which, which I differentiate from the pushback because here, in my view, there is tacit support of, for the US position on, on the part of many advanced and developing economies. And it also has bipartisan support in the US. So the US-China trade war will likely survive the transition to a new administration, 
although the tactics may change. The tactics and the tone may change. One reason that instigated, that initiated this, the US-China trade war, which has been enunciated by policymakers in the US and elsewhere, is that China may have observed the letter of its WTO obligations, but not its spirit. They point to currency under valuation, the ubiquitous role of state enterprises, and complex mercantilist arrangements of subsidies, hidden and overt, that advantage Chinese firms. What makes the so-called China problem so difficult is that China is too large to ignore, but its interconnections with the West are so deep as to permit no easy decoupling. And let's be frank about it. The US-China confrontation is also driven by superpower rivalry. And although American policymakers may not admit it openly, US trade restrictions are one of many arrows in their quiver to contain China's rise and its challenge to US hegemony. These tensions are mirrored in geopolitical tensions in China and Japan as well, which may have climbed to the surface in recent decades, but which have roots that go back to the Second World War. So in a scenario where the US-China trade war escalates further, some reshoring and diversification of supply chains could be favorable to Southeast Asia as well as to Mexico, thanks to the USMCA, which would, although there is also evidence that Korea could also benefit, especially in high value added and high technology segments. And I'll come back to this re, uh, relocation of firms from China to other countries. But let me come to the technological decoupling part, perhaps the most difficult issue that faces us. And it will have a more profound impact on supply chains. And the technological decoupling I'm referring to is primarily between that of China and the United States, although one must recognize there's also technological decoupling taking place between other countries, especially between India and China, which is, which is worth mentioning. Just as in trade, US policymakers complain that the current system in China has been able to allow the Chinese to have their cake and eat it too. That, in other words, it has gained from the global innovation system while keeping its market largely protected, progressing with indigenization of technologies and taking steps to become technologically autonomous. And it has done this not just to FDI. It has, done, it has done this using other channels of technology transfer, such as sending abroad tens of thousands of researchers and students to learn, graduate students to learn from advanced economies and bring back knowledge. Indeed, recently more than a thousand Chinese researchers were asked to leave the United States amidst the US crackdown on alleged technology theft. China has also absorbed technology from foreign companies wanting a foothold in its market. It has accessed technology by investing in high-tech startups in the US and Europe, has licensed technologies, and has built systems to gather information on the cutting edge technologies developed around the world. So if there were to be a deep decoupling, it could potentially create two walled gardens, if you wish, a China allied trading bloc based on Chinese technologies uh, and a Chinese sort of focused supply chain and another block uh, with the United States and at the center. And this has big implications for all biz businesses with technology manufacturers amongst those most affected. The mutual dependency between the US and Chinese technology sectors has been a critical factor in the way multinationals have allocated their investments and acquired some of their global dominance. So there are several questions that rise, arise. Is it conceivable, for example, that FDI in both directions could grind to a halt and a process of disinvestment commence Will this lead to the emergence of two internet systems and two 5G networks? How would this affect onshoring by US and European firms and the development of robotic and 3D technology and so forth? And how might this disengagement affect the capital intensive biotechnology and the focus of R&D? M&Es are already engaging with such issues. One option has been considered is to partner with, the local, with local business in China to gain access to the Chinese market with a mandate requiring purchases from indigenous companies. For example, Hewlett Packard has a successful partnership with H3C that opens up the Chinese enterprise IT market for Hewlett Packard Enterprises. MEs, multinationals, might also look to acquire assets in China, where China has the strength 
uh, which the US lacks, such as, for example, in 5G equipment. Similarly, Chinese companies are looking to diversify by investing outside China. Alibaba in 2018 doubled its investment in Southeast Asian online shopping giants. And Chinese smartphone brands such as Oppo, Vivo, and Xiaomi have expanded their operations in European and the US in the US markets. So let me sort of move on to the other point that I want to make about these forces are being counterbalanced by two other forces. One of them is the rise of unit labor costs in China, technological decoupling notwithstanding, China's trajectory up the value chain itself, reshaping value chain. Uh, the annual JETRO survey for Japanese m and is, is revealing is revealing. ASEAN dominates over China as the preferred investment destination, and Vietnam and Thailand dominate over other ASEAN preferred destinations. Vietnam is the main beneficiary of this. The earlier fears that its growing bilateral deficit of the United States would put in the crosshairs of retaliatory action by a belligerent Trump administration, but the change in administration would suggest that policies other than bilateral trade balances would be used to assess whether section 301 and section 232 in the United States uh, will, be, will be applied. The other important point is the creation of RCEP and CPTPP. And let me just focus on RCEP because it is very much an Asian, Asian trading agreement um, just been approved last week. It, has, uh, it, it encompasses members that account for 30%, a third of global GDP and a third of population. It is huge in the sense that it has 20 chapters, 14,367 total pages and includes schedules and services and investment amongst other things. The main point that I want to make is this, that for the purposes of this discussion, the most significant element in the RCEP is the fact that it has one rule of origin for all member countries, which means that investments can now move across borders within RCEP members and still have uh, access to all uh, East Asian to East Asian markets to all the RCEP members, and that is a very important uh, 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 development because what it will do it will allow the reshaping of value chains within Asia uh, to to locate wherever there are uh, wherever wherever comparative advantage presents itself, but still have access to all the markets amongst uh, 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 um, RCEP members. Finally, a quick mention about the pandemic and the search for resilience. Nowhere is this more true than a concern with the security of medical supply chains and PPEs and ventilators. Uh, but now the focus has also shifted to vaccine production. And this could definitely lead to some reshoring of production or the diversification of backward supply chains to make sure that countries are not caught on the wrong foot again. So this brings me to my final point and I'll make it really very short. And that is, that all of these forces are going to reshape global value chains. And I suspect that we have seen the halcyon days of uh, value chain growth uh, behind us, but it's not very clear which way it's going to do. It's important to remember though, that as Professor you mentioned, GVCs have been remarkably resilient. Already global trade is back to where it was in 2017 and it's a stone's throw away from the peak for 2019. The Shanghai Trade Container Index shows remarkably sharp growth. The World Container Index shows remarkably sharp growth. The trade is coming back very sharply. This has been supported by the fact that trade policies have been liberalized and trade facilitation has been accelerated. But having said all that, if the technology and the US-China trade wars intensify, then I think what you're going to see are two things. First, we're going to see a very costly decoupling of firms. In fact, one estimate shows that it will cost about a trillion dollars for all non-Chinese firms to relocate away from China. And that could take decades to, uh, 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 to happen if it indeed comes to that, if there is no uh, rapprochement between the United States and, and China. But I think more importantly, the technological decoupling will lead to enormous costs as these two technology giants have to unravel their connections from each other. And that process will not only be costly in and of itself, but it will lead to suboptimal outcomes 
for the medium term and perhaps even for the long term for each group as well as for the, the global economy. And finally, let me just say that if you look at the distribution of costs associated with this outcome, my assessment would be that the costs to China would be far greater than the costs uh, to the United States. So I think it's very much in China's interest to try and resolve it's uh, the, the, the concerns raised by the United States and the United States frankly is the proxy for the rest of the Western world. Uh, and that I think uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see as to how that, uh, how that uh, uh, unravels. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Lin. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, now I'd like to invite our second panelist, uh, Dr. Matu. So, uh, I, I know it's uh, very early uh, in, uh, uh, in India, but um, I like to. Uh, I, I, I'm, and I know you have a PowerPoint presentation, and I'd like to invite you to make a presentation. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Lim. Um, I hope you can hear me, and I hope you can see my screen. Yep, I, we can see uh, see the screen very clearly. Yep. Thank you uh, again for inviting me. I face a slight challenge. I was invited because I led this World Development Report on Global Value Chains. And I was asked to participate in this event, the focus of which is very much on what has been happening recently. And I have, uh, I think, made the mistake of trying to fulfill both roles because the World Development Report preceded some of these recent developments. And um, I am acutely aware that I'm going to try and say too much in too little time. But what I propose to do is very briefly give you a flavor of the World Development Report and how it looked at certain longer term patterns of both participation and consequences of, uh, of global value chains. And then turn and spend a little bit more of time on some research we have done, which tries to do precisely what you suggested, Professor Lim, to look empirically at uh, recent developments to try and understand what has been happening. I'm really uh, grateful to uh, my dear friend uh, Vikram for having laid out with, uh, again, characteristic insight, uh, the broad landscape, and it m enables me to focus on the petty details now. So first, just to begin with, and in order to motivate the empirical work that I'm going to present, it's important to see how economists have thought about global value chains in a way that could lends itself to measurement. And there are two ways uh, that countries participate. One is forward participation, which is by producing inputs most obviously raw materials like cocoa and copper or services imports like semiconductors, which then are used by other countries to produce products for export. The first set of countries is thought of as participating in a forward way. And the countries that buy inputs and then sell them are thought of as participating as in a, in a backward participation, which is an awkward term, but basically the use of inputs for export. Now, all countries participate in global value chains, but in different ways. And this is what the World Development Report uh, measured and described, that a large number of the countries that we at the World Bank are concerned about lie at the very base of global value chains. Many countries in Africa, for example, producing copper and uh, cocoa, as well as countries in uh, East Asia, like Laos or Mongolia, basically are at the base of value chains producing commodities. Some have broken into limited manufacturing, and this is countries like Cambodia and Ethiopia, which are basically uh, using cloth or leather and buying it and using it to explore garments and shoes. Still others have moved into more advanced manufacturing and services. 
and examples are countries in Eastern Europe and uh, Malaysia in the region, which are buying more sophisticated inputs like semiconductors from Korea and using them to export electronic goods or buying computers as India does and exports uh, sophisticated IT services. And relatively few countries like Korea, the United States, Japan, and much of Europe are located at this cutting edge and producing innovative goods and services. What I want to do now is give you a quick flavor of some of the countries in Asia and how they have been participating. Because if we think of transformation, it's not just the exogenous forces, but it's also the aspirations of these countries to engage in progressively more sophisticated ways. A very quick view first of what do we see as analytically most interesting about global value chains. First of all, the phenomenon of hyper-specialization. The global value chains encourage a finer and finer division of labor. And this is like Adam Smith on steroids. The second is that increasingly, these are not anonymous arm's length transactions on markets, but involve firm to firm relationships which are durable and therefore conducive to transfers of technology and support through you know, provision of standardized inputs and uh, credit and a range of other support that is extended from one firm to another because there is a mutual stake in beneficial performance. So the World Development Report, our first goal was to try and understand what drives it. And we looked at geography, endowments, institutions, and market size, and what are the consequences for growth, for poverty, inequality, the environment. And we also looked at how the determinants are not, again, destiny is not based on what countries have, but what countries choose to do in terms of their policies on openness, connectivity, and cooperation, as well as the outcomes can be shaped by choices of policies, for example, relating to social and environmental protection. I cannot inflict the whole richness of this World, w, uh, World Development Report on you. So I'll focus primarily, as I said, on giving you a flavor of how some key countries in the region are participating and aspiring to participate and how there have been the kind of powerful development consequences that Vikram described. But I'll do this relatively quickly. And I'm very happy to talk about this more and to share this presentation with you. So first of all, there is a large country like India, which is about a quarter less engaged by some crude indicators of backward and forward participation in global value chains. Central to India is this interesting uh, contrast, which Devesh and others have thought about perhaps more deeply than me, is that on the one hand, this first transition from commodities to basic manufacturing it has never really fully taken advantage of them. And therefore, this big kick that comes in terms of growth and employment, which, for example, we see now in countries as distinct as Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Vietnam, it never really fully benefited from it. But in contrast, it has made this precocious transition from basic manufacturing to more advanced manufacturing and services global value chains, which we know about. Now, some people think that India doesn't participate, but it does. It imports crude oil and turns it into petroleum products. It imports diamonds and turns them into jewelry. It imports uh, basic uh, uh, chemicals from China and turns them into medicines. But essentially, its whole pattern of participation has been a consequence of deep distortions, the relative rigidity of its market for low skill labor, the slow growth in an improvement in its infrastructure for trading goods relative to the infrastructure for trading services where it has made much more progress, restrictive trade policy, which continues to become more restrictive in a way the curse of the large domestic market, which I will argue also characterizes a country like Indonesia, constantly, you know, tempts India into 
uh, a more import substituting approach in a way that misses the central point that global value chains that have enabled a country like Bangladesh and Vietnam involve making it easier for people to import parts and components and process them for export in a way that enables you to specialize. And finally, even with services reform is uh, still incomplete and its access to foreign markets is not as good as that of its rival countries, which have been able to negotiate better trade agreements or preferential access. So where India seeks to go is, and where it should go, is to deepen its engagement in manufacturing value chains while consolidating its strengths in services. How much that will happen remains to be seen. Now, when you think of other countries in the region, I pick Malaysia as an example. Malaysia is the most powerful example of a country which has powerful backward participation in that it has imported uh, components, electronic components, and successfully exported them to the rest of the world. But it is relatively limited forward participation. Now, forward participation, this chart shows you, has contrasting uh, uh, forms. There are countries like Taiwan and Japan, which use uh, semiconductors and produce them and sell them to other countries who then use them in their exports. But there are also countries which use, produce commodities like palm oil in Indonesia, and they are also big forward participants. Now in Malaysia's case, its transition from commodities to basic manufacturing has been extremely successful but it has had a limited success in moving into more advanced uh, services and innovative goods. It has reaped the benefits of openness to trade and investment in goods, but persists with restrictions in services. Um, and technology uh, diffusion, uh, I'm trying to get rid of my presentation, uh, this thing for a second so I can see. Yeah, so the, it has reaped the benefits uh, And it's harnessed technology diffusion. And what it needs to do, and what it aspires to do, is to advance both in services and innovation. But that will depend crucially on its enhancement of human capital. But fundamental problem for Malaysia right now has been to strike a balance, a better balance, between its growth and equity goals. Because both protection and services and affirmative action have in a way handicapped its progression. Indonesia is, and Vikram has thought about and lived and worked in Indonesia, is the country which has lost its moho. Basically, it was one of the more dynamic and it had seemed to resist the commodity curse, but it's progressively losing market share to countries like Vietnam and even Thailand from forward participation in commodities, but not really engaged much in uh, the kind of industrializing uh, global value chain participation like Malaysia. It is implementing big reforms which liberalize investment, but don't do enough to deal with its trade policy impediments. And there is also a risk that it's going to choose soft options, like uh, relaxing its environmental and social safeguards, rather than the harder questions of reducing logistic costs and transport. Now, this is all happening in a world, as Vikram said, where the global value chain expansion has slowed. The most recent data showed a downturn and not the revival that Vikram mentioned. And I think the, one of the reasons is the increasing self-sufficiency of China that is producing more domestically than it used to import. And it's a big, important player. Even in East Asia, there is this great flattening that set in after the big, great recession. And the rat is the question of why we care about global value chains. And the reason is that they have been, as Vikram said, a powerful force for development, created better jobs, reduced poverty. But there is a downside. Their impact on the environment in many cases has been adverse and they have contributed to increased inequality. I think it's important to recognize these things because this will also tell us what we need to do to sustain the climate of openness. 
Now, quick evidence we in the report, we show how firms that participate in global value chains because of these dual forces of hyper-specialization and relationship-based trade, which is conducive to a diffusion of technology, tend to be more productive, that East Asian countries have successfully, which have participated in global value chains, have seen big increases in productivity, that it's that first break that India missed and Cambodia, Vietnam, and Bangladesh are exploiting, which gives the biggest growth kick, that even though global value chain firms are typically more capital intensive, possibly because of the need for intercompatibility, they are more dynamic because the productivity benefits that come enable them to grow and generate lots of employment. In Vietnam, for example, the regions which have seen the greatest participation in global value chains and where have seen the greatest growth are precisely the regions which have seen the biggest reductions in poverty. One big question, is technological change, in particular automation, inhibiting and likely to reduce the importance of outsourcing in global value chains. I think one of the most interesting results in the global value chain was to show that the sectors of the economy which have seen the greatest aut uh, automation, like the car production sector, are the sectors which have seen some of the fastest growth in imports from developing countries. And the intuition is simple, that the substitution effect from labor to robots is more than dwarfed by the income and scale effect of the increased productivity, which means that countries which are automating are also choosing to import more of the components that have not been uh, or cannot be automated from developing countries. So on a technological front in manufacturing, the kind of pessimism that has set in is probably not justified, but it's wrong to be complacent because as I'll come back to it, I think in a country like China, as Vikram said, there is this race between the increase in the real wage and the decline in the price of the robot. And that race in a way defines the window for industrialization in a lot of other countries, which, and it's that race which will determine how much the Chinese producer chooses to hire the Bangladeshi rather than by a robot. The downsides are certainly that across countries, there are inequalities. How you participate determines how much you benefit. And there is increasing concentration in the more sophisticated producers and more competition in the less sophisticated producers in a way that the gains from global value chain are not equally distributed. That within countries, inequality has definitely been affected by the possibilities of outshoring. And therefore, one of the ways that we need to think about how we can keep openness alive is by thinking of how we need to cooperate beyond trade in other areas, especially areas like taxation. So that was a lightning overview of the global value chain story. I don't know exactly where we are on the thing, but I would like to spend, if I have about the next you know, seven, eight minutes now giving you a lightning overview of what has happened since the World Development Report and especially how the COVID shock is, is affecting global value chains. I should say at the beginning, one um, uh, uh, thing that, you know, what uh, Robert Solo said about productivity, that, uh, uh, or rather about the IT revolution being evident everywhere except in the productivity statistics, I think is true a little bit about trade, that I s hear and see relocation and reconfiguration everywhere except in the trade statistics. So that is uh, an interesting question. Is it just that we are not, there hasn't been enough time to observe the changes that everybody is uh, perceiving or predicting? But the big few points that I want to make is that after two decades of hyper-globalization, we first saw a big shock during the recession, which ushered in this great flattening in growth of both trade relative to GDP and global value chains. The second shock was the US-China trade wars, which, and the third has been the pandemic. And 
I would argue that the pandemic is affecting five prior trends in trade. One, a contraction due to the supply and demand shocks, increased regionalization, which had already happened, but will be even more evident in East Asia because the countries have recovered together and therefore demand and supply is recovering. Some relocation of manufacturing, building on, as Vikram said, the pressures already created by increasing real wages will be a new dependence aversion that the Dean mentioned right at the beginning. Then I think, and this is very interesting, a growth in services because of the sunk costs of digitization. And finally, still pressure to protect, driven by inequality, which I just mentioned, insecurity, which is worry about access to essential products, and I think most profoundly, international rivalry. Again, I will rush through these elements, but argue that there's little cause for trade pessimism or an inward turn, but rather a strong case for deeper domestic reform, deeper international cooperation, and as I mentioned, cooperation beyond trade to keep trade open. Again, a lightning look at some of the evidence. Very interesting observation that in the Great Recession, GDP fell, but trade fell much more. In this recession, GDP has fallen a lot and trade has surprised us by its relative resilience. Big shocks to some of the most important hubs, the 17 countries which account for more than 70-80% of global trade and global value chain trade were the worst affected in this crisis. Work we have done, and this is looking at now export growth and changes in mobility within countries. And this is the month of February, this is the month of March, this is the month of April. That very strong connection between reductions in mobility, we also looked at industrial production and hence exports, and very strong reduction in imports related to changes in retail mobility in importing countries. Again, you need to hear now, sorry, uh, first I'm still talking about worker mobility, export mobility. This was the contraction phase, and this is the recovery phase. The recovery phase has a less close relationship, but still evident. In importing countries, the same relationship, but retail mobility is what mattered for importing. And what has happened to trade in general is a consequence of shocks that have happened both to source countries, to home countries and destination countries. And one of the most interesting points that I would like to make based on our research is that there is a huge focus on the shock to source country, which has led to this perception that global value chains are a force for transmission of shocks and they have been a disruptive influence. There hasn't been enough, enough attention to the fact that Outsourcing is also a form of diversification and has mitigated the shocks that came to home countries. So the foreign shocks certainly have been disruptive, but the domestic shocks have been mitigated by participation in global value chains. And that matters in a world where the shocks are not synchronized. And this is empirical evidence which just confirms that countries did in fact benefit from reliance on imported inputs when they were hit, though they were hurt when their trading partners were hit. And there are some very interesting patterns, but I will not dwell on them. Certainly, trade had become progressively more regionalized, especially in East Asia. It's becoming even more so because faster growth in East Asia means that, for example, China is importing more from its partners than from the United States, despite these ambitious commitments. And the rest of the region is also buying more from China. And very interesting reason for some of these shifts is the fact that China's stimulus has concentrated so much on supporting its firms rather than its households that the rebalancing that was happened where China was growing much more its consumptions uh, rather than its uh, exports, rather than its investment in exports, that whole thing has been reversed. Again, China's growth is being driven by investment, uh, 
and uh, exports rather than consumption. And this will matter for these global imbalances and will create stress. What happens if people, why do, do people relocate? And learning from the past shocks, and this is another piece of research that we have done, shows that when Japan was hit with this big earthquake, you did not see a relocation from Japan. You did not, sorry, you did not see reshoring. You did not see nearshoring. You didn't even see so much diversification, but you saw switching. That where countries were heavily dependent on Japan, they moved out, especially in high share things. And where did they go? They went to Vietnam, but they did not go to Indonesia. And this again reaffirms how important domestic reform is going to be to shape participation. But it also shows that dependence aversion can lead to switching and we are probably likely to see some of it happening now. But analytically, it's worth remembering that how much you switch depends on a comparison of fixed costs with the variable cost savings. And in a crisis, shrinking output makes the benefits of switching lower because when you compare fixed costs with cost savings times output, that inequality favors inertia. I'll come back to that. And that's an important way in which the current crisis is different from the tsunami, which wiped out some capital. Here, no capital has been wiped out, but output has shrunk. So it is a recipe for inertia rather than relocation, but offset by this dependence aversion. Services are changing because face-to-face -face transactions weren't possible. Firms and households are investing, even though transport and travel have crumbled. Data intensive services are growing. Unfortunately, the region continues to protect its services sectors. Many of the countries in the region are relatively open to goods, but continue to be restricting its services. Again, a very interesting question because more and more trade becomes digitized. And even though you have these domestic champions in places like Indonesia, unfortunately, a country like Indonesia hasn't really implemented the deep reform needed to improve its services performance. Protection is growing, certainly motivated by the worry about access to essential facilities. You have had these export restrictions. The fact that recovery will be fueled by heavy support by, from the government will lead to countervailing and anti-dumping uh, uh, duties. But we are also seeing opening as countries realize trade is a way of accessing what they need rather than uh, antithetical to their recovery. But we do need to think hard about the future. We need to think about deeper international cooperation, which addresses the subsidies, the state enterprises, which are so crucial in recovery and are likely to invite protection. RCEP begins to do it, but perhaps even more important than that, we need to think hard about how we can cooperate beyond trade to equip the state to compensate the losers, to prevent concentration from uh, ensuring that only a few firms appropriate all the gains and from ensuring that data continues to flow while respecting individual rights. I'll stop here. There are some interesting slides I have, but I think in the interest of time, I'll only come back to them if we have time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, that presentation. Not only did, uh, did you cover the flagship report, you also gave a nice sense of what's called, uh, what's been happening since the publication of the report. So uh, uh, thanks indeed. Now, our final speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Sung Hun Chang. Uh, he's a fellow at Korea Development Institute, and uh, he'd like to focus his attention on GVC re reconfiguration as it relates to uh, Korea's uh, economic fortunes. So Dr. Chang. Hello, um, can you guys hear me? Yep, yep, we can hear you, yep. Okay, um, let me first share my slide. Uh, so uh, hopefully you can see my slide through, through the monitor. Yep, do you? Yep, we can, yep, yep, okay. we can see it. So, um, uh, hello everyone, my name is Song Hun Jung. I'm, I'm from KDI. 
uh, it's a brick, it, it is a great honor for me to be a part of this conference and um, uh, uh, it was a pleasure to hear the two presenters' presentations. So given the two interesting presentation by uh, Dr. Naru and Dr. Matu, um, I would like to shift our focus to uh, global value chain surrounding Korea. So I think the, my task is uh, to provide a brief picture of the global uh, value chains um, centered on Korea. Okay. So to do so, what I'm going to do is uh, I would like to estimate the impact of foreign shocks uh, through the global value chain on the Korean economy. And then what I will do is I consider uh, first the supply side and then and then second the demand side uh, and then it's the in the supply side we can ask the, the following question of um, how much does korean manufacturing rely on foreign sourcing both directly and indirectly and uh, if we rely and which countries does korea uh, rely on the most and the same question can apply to demand side as well. How much is the Korean GDP uh, accounted for by foreign demand? Uh, again, both directly and indirectly. And um, which country is the largest contributor to, to the Korean GDP? So I can estimate uh, some of my estimation um, year by year and I can compare the magnitude of the shocks before and after the global financial crisis. Um, so that's what I will do. But before I get into the detail, I would like to start with this uh, nice picture published in WT report uh, last year. So above here shows that um, um, exports of final goods, uh, the trade network of uh, final goods, um, so the global world can be uh, grouped into three, uh, as you can see here, uh, and each group, um, there's hub countries, in this case, Germany, China, and the U.S., and there, um, I mean, these three countries are connected with each other through the trade, uh, in the case of a final goods export, but at the bottom, you can see uh, regarding the global value chain trade, uh, by the way, what I mean by GVC trade is um, it's basically intermediate good trade, but uh, that cross the border at least two times. Uh, so that way we define the GVC trade. And, and in terms of GVC trade, this link between these hub countries uh, uh, is uh, basically disconnected. So as a uh, you know, Dr. Matu said, um, is, we say global value chain, but it's, it's more likely a regional value chain. And Korea is uh, involved in this group uh, where China plays a central role. And you can see here, uh, the arrow is very thick between China and Korea. Uh, so we, I would like to highlight this relationship. Okay. so. Um, I can just skip here. Um, so here's my estimation result. Um, so question is, what if all industries in all foreign country uh, experience a 1% supply shock, uh, which is measured by productivity shocks? How does it affect the Korean economy? Again, um, it's what if all other industries in all foreign countries experience a 1% productivity shock, which is a supply shock. How does it aggregately affect Korean economy by industry? So at the bottom here, it indicates industry code according to the industry classification. For example, um, 20 to 21 is chemical industry, 26 is electronic industry, 29 is auto industry. So as you can see, uh, because I cannot estimate the actual productivity shock or uh, supply the supply side shocks, so I instead it just assume that they experienced the one percent, uh, you know, supply shock. 
And so the absolute magnitude is not that important. What matters is a relative uh, magnitude between 2005 and 2015 in this case. As you can see, uh, the foreign shocks, their impact is, has grown in all industries except the 29, which is the auto industry. What that means is that now Korea in 2015, we are relying more on foreign sources compared to 2005. So, so then the nat natural question is, uh, um, which countries are the most, uh, the most impactful on the Korean economy? So I can decompose this, um, the magnitude of, uh, magnitude of the shocks by the sourcing country. Um, here's the results. As you can see, um, you know, the supply shock from China is absolutely uh, very high compared to other countries. So this is just an incomparable uh, in, throughout all the industries here. Um, so how is it compared to back in uh, 10 years ago, which is 2005, um, it was like this. So comparing these two figure, um, the impact from China and other country um, in 2015 and 2005 here, you can see that for other countries, their impact is pretty much a similar or um, their impact is even um, slightly decreased. But on the other hand, the Chinese impact is grown very fast over the 10 years. So what that means is that the, the increase of the magnitude of the supply shock from, from all foreign countries uh, appeared in this figure is mostly driven by China. So that's how we rely on Chinese economy in terms of um, supply side. Okay, and then someone say can say that well, you know, global value chain um, has been stagnated since um, since the global financial crisis, and even after uh, 2015, it may have shrunken a lot. So. Um, because I can't provide the specific um, statistic or estimate since 2015, but I can uh, conjecture uh, based on this figure. This is shows uh, China's share in Korean trade. So import side, as you can see at, at the bottom here, um, less than 15% of uh, total import was coming from China back in 2005. But in 2015 here, um, China's share is over 20% and China's share is maintained above 20% afterwards. So I don't think um, its impact is, has shrinked since 2015. Um, and interestingly, we have a big jump actually in, in China's import share increase in 2015. I think the main reason is that um, because in 2015, Korea, China, free trade agreement was effective since 2015. That's why we observed this uh, big jump in 2015. So here's another picture um, that shows um, sourcing pattern in Korea uh, through the product level import. So X axis shows that import share of the country and Y axis shows a number of products. So for example, here in China, um, it's about 70 to eight products. Um, the import share of the 70 to eight products, uh, sorry, it's the import share of, imp import, a Chinese import share uh, of those uh, 70 to 80 products was uh, exactly 50%. And in this case here, um, you know, um, we more than 400 products are solely imported from China. So this number is uh, significant as well compared to other country, as you can see. Um, and um, if I count all of these products uh, appeared in this all figure, 
uh, there are 7,000 products are uh, relying on, on, on a single country. Uh, at least 50% uh, of the import uh, is coming from one single country. Uh, that's what I mean. So among the 7,000 products, um, China's share is uh, almost 40% in 2019. Again, back in 2001, it used to be a 20%, but it's doubled over the last 20 years. And as you can see, China's share is keep increasing over time. So that's the um, supply side reliance of Korea on, um, on the rest of the world, especially China. Now we turn to the demand side um, reliance. Um, the strategy is um, GDP can be decomposed into, in terms of ex expenditure GDP. Uh, that GDP is decomposed into two part, one domestic and, and the other foreign. Um, and foreign contribution is, uh, can be measured. It's called sometimes a value added export, which measures how much of the Korean GDP is ultimately observed by the foreign uh, country. Um, so if I measure the value added exports um, share, um, it'll show the foreign contribution to the Korean GDP. But before I do that, uh, here shows that contribution of GDP of the domestic final, Korean domestic final demand. It used to be uh, above 75% in 2005, but all of a sudden, during the uh, global financial crisis period, its share shrinked, uh, and then uh, keep decreasing here. And um, even now, uh, it's less than 70%, its contribution. Okay, if you look at just manufacturing, the same pattern appears here on the right-hand side. So, um, decreasing share of domestic final demand means that increasing share of foreign final demand, right? So we can look at the foreign contribution to the Korean GDP. Again, China is keep rising since the um, global financial crisis. Uh, their value added export shares keep rising uh, since 2008, um, whereas other countries, the contribution is uh, shrinking mostly. So what that means is, is China has become the biggest market uh, as well as uh, uh, its biggest uh, production site to Korea economy. Again, um, you know, their, the Chinese impact in terms of demand side has not been, uh, has not shrinked since the global uh, financial crisis. If you look at this aesthetics, um, we uh, total 25% of um, total Korean export is um, headed to China since the global uh, financial crisis. So it seems like uh, there's a, some structural change in Korean export market. So in actually, um, I'm just gonna skip this one. So actually what happened at the time during the global financial crisis, um, we all know that um, global financial crisis is, uh, is mostly demand shock as I mentioned by uh, Dr. Matu. Um, and, um, and especially advanced countries like United States and European Union countries suffer from a significant uh, drop in final demand. In case of China, to counteract the, the, that kind of negative shocks, uh, they kind of implemented the historic level of uh, stimulus package, right? And um, at the time, the, the initial amount was a 40 trillion yuan and plus alpha, uh, which is about 13% uh, 13.5% of the domestic economy at the time. So as a result, um, compared to the GDP growth rate, which is 9.4% at the time, um, Chinese domestic market has grown much faster, which is 13.4% um, at the time. And since then, um, 
I think China's growth strategy changed a little bit. They, uh, prior to the financial, uh, global financial crisis, they focused on export market. But since the GFC, they uh, uh, had it, their focus to the domestic market. Somehow, um, although in 2009, there was a significant increase in, in investment, but after that, they somehow uh, uh, managed to uh, change their uh, growth strategy to consumption side. So consumption contribution to the domestic market growth is uh, much bigger than investment after uh, the global financial crisis, as you can see. So because of the domestic market growth in China, especially on durable growth, as you can see here, because durable goods is the most active in, in terms of global value chain, uh, and it's the Chinese domestic market uh, growth can have a significant impact through the global value chain of the durable goods to other countries. So we can estimate the uh, you know, uh, domestic market growth in China, how does it affect uh, GDP growth in other countries? And here's an estimate, in 2009, China induced, uh, you know, GDP growth in Australia, for example, uh, by 0.37% growth rate. And all this statistics shows that positive impact of Chinese domestic market expenditure growth. On the other hand, the U.S. has a negative effect, obviously, because they suffered negative, uh, negative domestic market growth at the time. And the biggest beneficiary at the time was actually its neighboring countries, including Korea and Malaysia here uh, and uh, Taiwan here. Uh, and even after the global uh, financial crisis, its impact pretty much maintained. In uh, for example, in this case, Korea, uh, China's um, domestic market growth, the impact of domestic market growth on Chinese, uh, on Korea's GDP growth is 0.6% uh, here uh, in 2009. 0.87% in 2010 and 0.84% in 2011. So it's a pretty much maintained after wars. So um, in summary, um, I would say that since the global financial crisis, Korean economy has been relying more and more on Chinese supply and the demand as well, as we've seen. Um, and in the supply side, We've seen a heavy reliance on China's uh, in sourcing intermediate goods um, compared to other countries. And the demand side, uh, I think China's so-called you know, dual circulation among the dual circulation, internal circulation has been already started uh, since the global financial crisis. And it seemed to have caused the structural change in Korean uh, export market. So, so my conclusion based on this, uh, estimation um, is the following. Increasing reliance on China is a potentially huge risk to Korea, especially we have suffered back in 2017 when uh, thought missiles uh, deployed into Korea. Uh, we experienced a retaliation of uh, economic retaliation from China. So uh, we kind of have a, some fear uh, of a similar thing. So if especially if the tension between the U.S. and China increases further, um, the heavy reliance on China is potentially very risky to Korean economy. And high-tech industries, because the U.S. is emphasizing the decoupling in high-tech industries, but then the high-tech industries actively utilize the global value chain and their reliance on China is also very high. Um, so that's another uh, risky point. And also, unfortunately, um, decoupling with China is getting more and more costly. Um, in fact, the market forces are even more favorable to, to China. Since the 2015, as I mentioned, the Korea-China FTA uh, has been effective and tariff radius is gradually um, eliminated over time. And also, we made an agreement to, on RCEP as well. So, um, 
And another thing, paradoxically, China is successfully controlling the COVID-19 situation now. So uh, as a businessman, you know, still the China is the most attractive market as well as a production side, site. And then that, you know, argument is, a, is anecdotally backed up by this recent survey report by uh, Chambers of Commerce in Korea, uh, where almost 85% of the respondents said that they will keep or even increase um, doing the business with China. So um, I think more active, more aggressive diversification strategies are requested, uh, driven by Korean government. Uh, for example, strengthening the new Southern policy. I think with this, um, in maybe in the second session, uh, this topic is discussed in more detail. Um, so I don't mention about it, but um, this is a diversification strategy. We can think about uh, CPTPP as well, um, and um, given the current Korean domestic market situation, I don't think the reshoring policy is that effective. Um, so that's uh, my basic opinion. Thank you. Okay. Right. okay, thank you very much. I think you shed a light on where Korea is with respect to uh, global value chains, uh, regional value chains, and uh, what the future looks like and what kinds of risks uh, we face as strategic competition uh, intensifies uh, in our region. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'd like to now move to uh, a discussion. Um, uh, if I may, as a moderator for this uh, panel, I'd like to pose some questions first and then uh, also curate some questions from the uh, uh, audience and try to get the uh, discussion going. Um, uh, both uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Nehru and Dr. Mathieu uh, mentioned uh, the prospects for the future. And um, as uh, Dr. M uh, Mathieu mentioned, I mean, economically, you need to look at uh, the, the uh, fixed cost and variable cost of uh, uh, relocation. And uh, interestingly, COVID-19 uh, basically has left uh, capital intact uh, while reducing output. So uh, it makes it very difficult for a firm to try and relocate when it uh, still has to deal with a huge fixed cost, right? Uh, with uh, reduced demand. In addition, uh, as Professor Nehru mentioned, uh, even though uh, you know, people uh, and companies are trying to uh, reduce their over-dependence uh, on China, uh, when you look at economic merits, as well as uh, the state's ability to deal with a crisis, like a pandemic, right? uh, there aren't that many uh, countries, it seems, to have both uh, economic fundamentals and state capacity to deal with crisis. Uh, often we talk about Vietnam, but if you think about it, Vietnam is also run by a communist party, just like China. Right? And even though currently uh, geopolitics favors, uh, it seems, uh, uh, Vietnam, it still has uh, governance issues as well. Right? So given all these uh, considerations, how likely uh, do you think uh, this you know, prospect of decoupling really is? And uh, if you are running a multinational, what would be your strategy? Uh, some people have uh, talked about China plus one strategy or China, few, uh, China plus few strategy to uh, you know, try and uh, continue to benefit from uh, access to the Chinese market while uh, reducing over dependence on it. But at the end of the day, even if you try to diversify, uh, there aren't that many uh, countries, it seems, many host countries, it seems, to have both economic fundamentals and state capacity. So how would you, uh, you know, uh, uh, think about that, uh, Professor Nehru, uh, Dr. Mathieu, and Dr. Cheung as well? That would be one common question I'd like to pose. So, uh, Professor Nero? Yeah. Uh, well, 
let me i mean there are there are several questions that you that you that you that you pose there but let me start with the first one on um the impact of the pandemic on the location decisions of firms and you're quite right in fact i wrote an article where i made made the point uh that if you were a firm looking for alternative investment locations in light of what's just happened in the pandemic, one of the key factors that you would choose would be state capacity. Because if there were to be another similar sort of disaster, what you want is a state that is capable of bringing that disaster under control so that you can continue production and so forth. <clears throat> But I think what's happening in, in, in the world now is, I mean, and, and what my comments focused on is that there are forces that are not economic that are going to force firms to figure out where they should locate, but they are geopolitical forces. They are geostrategic forces. Um, and even if there were to be um, a, um, even if there were to be increased trade, trade tensions, say, between the United States and China, I don't think that in itself uh, uh, would be such a big concern as if the technological decoupling that I mentioned were to continue to barrel ahead. And that second point about technological decoupling is driven not by economic concerns, but by security concerns. They're driven by so, geopolitical and geostrategic concerns. And then firms have a really tough decision to make. Do they continue operating in, in China and then be restricted to a group of countries that would, be, that would uh, have their production capabilities on a foundation of Chinese source technology? Or will they uh, um, have to leave. And that is going to be a tough decision. And I think the writing on the wall is that these technological tensions are going to continue. They're going to get probably exacerbated. As I suggested, they're going to certainly survive the transition in the US, US administration. And um, that they are that there is tacit support for that position, I believe, in most of the Western world, even though it may not be explicit support, there is tacit support. And therefore, these issues are no longer economic, they're no longer financial decisions that firms have to make, they are sort of long term decisions as to whether they want to remain in the Chinese market, or leave the Chinese market. And I think what firms are trying to do now, as I as I understand it, is they're trying to do both, they're trying to have firms that are based in China that will become part of the Chinese ecosystem were that to, 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 to evolve. And they would also maintain their production bases in the West and be part of the Western ecosystem if that were indeed, indeed to happen. Thank you very much, Professor Lim. Um, I, I, I'm very glad that you made this point, which much more clearly than I did, that this pandemic is very different from the tsunami because the relevant equation is the benefits of relocating, which are the wedge in terms of quality adjusted cost savings times what you're going to produce and sell relative to the fixed costs. The tsunami wiped out a lot of capital and therefore you created a greater sensitivity to other opportunities. Now, in the case of COVID, as you very nicely said, the factories are intact. As you and Vikram both said, that in a way the state has demonstrated the capacity to contain the uh, virus. So the factories can also be operated much more quickly. It's not as if the factories are intact and you can't use them. In fact, you can use them faster there than anywhere else. So the fixed cost is of relocation is important. And at the same time, the pandemic has caused output to shrink. So F is much more likely to be greater than CQ in the current pandemic, and that becomes a force for inertia. And I think the main point is what Vikram said, but he said it more diplomatically than I will say it. The problem is not the economic merits of relocation. 
it's China's, it's not the state capacity, it's state reliability that is an issue. I think, again, the very nice presentation that uh, Sun Jun made omitted one crucial detail, is that not only is dependence on China increasing, but China does weaponize trade. It behaves in a perverse way by suddenly having spontaneous boycotts of whether it's Korean or Australian uh, uh, products when there are political issues. And that, I think, is genuinely perverse behavior on China's part because it's not in its best interest. As dependence of the rest of the world grows, one would expect China to reassure them, just as it has done in dealing with the COVID and demonstrating remarkable state capacity, it needs to demonstrate that it is a reliable trading partner. Because otherwise it encourages precisely the kind of dependence aversion which is leading countries to move away, even though it's, as you nicely said, it's not in their best economic interest. And I think there is a problem. And you know, as I said, if there is time, I'd like to show you one chart which makes me a little pessimistic. Again, Vikram very nicely said there is a consensus in the United States, even though the Biden presidency is likely to have a more less confrontational and a more multilateral approach in addressing this China question, there are fundamental structural issues associated with this hegemonic transition, which I've uh, thought about a little bit both historically and analytically, and if there's time, I'd like to come back to it. But I think the most interesting puzzle here is why does China not find ways of reassuring the world that it is able to maintain an arm's length relationship with both its suppliers and its buyers in a way that is in its own best interest? like to turn to uh, Dr. Chang for your thoughts on that question. Um, thank you um, for having such questions. And um, in fact, I, you know, I don't know much about the geopolitics and um, so I don't have uh, many answers about your questions. Uh, but uh, based on my talk, to you know, businessman in Korea, uh, you ask them me the question is how likely does the coupling occurs in the future? And then, as a global firm, what would be the best strategies for for them to diversify uh, their sourcing? Um, well, based on the talk, they they said that it's very hard to diversify because you know. Uh, China is very still for them um, economically very beneficial, but not only just as economical, but it's uh, they said that China is a pretty much reliable um, uh, country. Uh, so um, I I don't know. It's a, all, all I can say is. Um, um, the decoupling uh, in t for a individual firm, so relocating their production site to other other countries, um, has just uh, isn't isn't just an unattractive, um, you know what I mean. So, um, and again, um, there's another strategy that which is a reshoring, um, mm. as a Korean government emphasizes. So as a, Dr. Matu said, um, it is kind of domestic policy that can significantly drive the reconfiguration of global value chain, right? Uh, but again, in case of Korea, the situation is not very good because over the last uh, two or three years, uh, Korea increased actually uh, the corporate tax rate where other countries, they decrease corporate tax rate and also, um, you know, minimum wage has been significantly increased in Korea over the last two years. And so market condition is not very good. Actually, in fact, uh, you know, foreign direct investment net outflow is significantly grown up over the last two years. 
So many firms are actually started investing um, in countries like China uh, over the last two years when there is a significant tension between the United States and China. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, but it's uh, all I can say is uh, uh, it's very hard to decouple as a as a single firm. Um, Okay. Mr. Lim, one, 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 yes, lightning, yes. uh, one lightning observation. I just mm. wanted to say that, you know, the other perverseness is that the two big countries in the region, India and Indonesia, which mm. could offer the kind of scale that you need, as you nicely right. pointed out, are through their own perverse policies, making right. it even harder for people to relocate. So that's that right. is why, you know, I started with those, that narrative. That it's not just China's perverseness, it's right. the perverseness in other countries. And, and I, I think going forward, it will be important to have some plurilateral or multilateral arrangements where uh, countries can agree to uh, some constraint, constraining mechanisms uh, that offer uh, greater reliability and predictability. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid uh, we, we have run out of time for this panel. And I, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their uh, excellent presentations and uh, discussion as well. And uh, we'll resume after a short break at uh, 9.15, uh, about four minute break, five minute break here. So uh, thank you once again. And when panel two starts, uh, uh, Professor Kapoor will moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm Thank sorry you. for speaking too long. Thank you. No, very no, much. no, it was excellent. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Are you ready, uh, yeah. Professor Kapoor? Yeah. 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 Uh, is everyone here? Yeah. So, so we're going to start with our <coughs> uh, second panel, uh, which is on the geoeconomic and geostrategic implications of the Biden presidency for Asia. Uh, you know, uh, with the last panel, one of the empirical observations was how uh, the, the sort of deep economic relationships that countries in Asia, especially East Asia and Southeast Asia have with China. And, and, and Dr. Mattu, sort of <clears throat> raised some issues. And I think one of the ways to think about it is, uh, we saw how in the last two decades, Australia's economic relationship with China deepened so much. And yet we know what's been happening to China-Australia relations in the past uh, six months. And I think that sort of, of uh, very assertive uh, sort of international posture that China is taking. Uh, that's, uh, I, think, I think leaders around the world have been noticing it very, very deeply. So to try and understand some of the co complex sort of implications as we go forward, uh, we have a great panel picked for you. Uh, we'll, sort of, we'll sort of begin with uh, Dr. Kaiwan Kim, who is the executive director of the Center for International Industry and Trade at the Korean Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade. Uh, we'll then continue with Tammy Hoverby, who is senior director at, at McLarty Associates. She spent uh, more than two decades sort of living and working in Seoul where she was uh, the president of the US Korea Business Council. And then we'll end with, with, with uh, to Dr. White, uh, who is at SAIS and prior to that served in the National Security Council <laughs> and at the White House. Uh, so, so what we'll do is, uh, I think last panel went a bit sort of overboard. So if we can keep within 20 minutes, that will allow some room for you know, discussion. Uh, so we'll begin with you, to the Dr. Kim. Yes, hello everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, 
thank you for inviting me to, to this uh, excellent conference. Uh, in the first panel, uh, uh, three, uh, three panelists uh, uh, have, have already present, uh, explained the very the detailed, uh, detailed, detailed picture of GVC and the change and the very important dependence on China, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will Hello. Can you see me and can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Today I will I intend to approach the US US China decoupling issue uh, through two trade rules. Of course, the the this topic is the the the, the topic of the first panel. And um, but I uh, today I, I will approach the decoupling issue from more micro perspective and from Asian perspective. And I say that the, the, I say about the two two two, uh, two trade words. And one can one can be called the tariff battle, the battle, not war. And the other can be called the high tech emerging industry world. As uh, Professor uh, uh, Professor Nero uh, has emphasized, since I believe that the more important important aspect of the decoupling issue lies in the in the latter, I will analyze the GVC structure of the semiconductor and uh, electric vehicle uh, industry as a, a case study. And, and finally, I will propose some directions for. Korea's response strategy, and as uh, I can some some time, the direction of Korea and U.S. cooperation. Can you see my slide? The slide? Yes, we can. Okay. The 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 uh, that's the first of all the U.S.-China trade war, war one. There's the, the uh, tariff butter. I will say the effect of the tariff butter. The additional the as the additional tariff measures are very very broad enough to cover about seventy percent of seventy percent of bilateral trade. It's enormous. There's, after the introduction of additional tariff, uh, bilateral trade between the United States and China fell, of course. And uh, we can see the change in the import lines of the U.S. The share, the share of Chinese import to the U.S. of course have decreased significantly, and the share of the Taiwan and ASEAN group, especially from uh, from Vietnam, increased. As you can see uh, in the uh, left uh, panel, left, left left figure. And we can we can see also the change in the import in China. Uh, for example, the, the, the share of food stuff from uh, the share of food stuff from uh, from the United States has decreased, and the share of good uh, imported from Latin American countries, as Brazil, such as Brazil, and the share of Canadian, Australian, and Middle Eastern good has increased as well. You can see, uh, you can see the changes in the trade balance, U.S. trade balance, by uh, by major countries and regions. And you can see also the changes in the U.S. trade balance, but in this time, uh, by major ASEAN countries. For example, uh, this line uh, represents the, the Vietnamese uh, Vietnamese import. Import from Vietnam to uh, to USA. It has increased very very rapidly uh, in recent years. But how about how about the U.S. trade balance as a whole? 
I'd like to say that uh, in in the in terms of the bilateral trade between U.S. and China, there is some some change, but the U.S. trade uh, U.S. U.S. trade deficit as a whole continues to increase paradoxically. But the China's share of growth of the total trade deficit decreased uh, from 50 percent to 40 percent. But on the other hand, the trade deficit with the ASEAN, ASEAN countries and other major regions has rather increased. Uh, in particular, deficit with Vietnam, Malaysia uh, have increased significantly. Uh, thus, uh, as a conclusion from this observation, as the two countries left the tariff on each other's goods, uh, the, for the U.S., for example, import merely switched from China to other countries in Asia, and for China, import switched, uh, switched from the United States to other countries in Central and South America and other countries. And China's response, why is the China's response? In order to produce labor-intensive crop, even the Chinese companies has responded quickly by relocating production bases outside of China, especially to uh, Southeast, Southeast Asia. And internally, Chinese industry, industry continues to upgrade. And the expansion uh, of Chinese-based companies uh, into overseas is acceler ex accelerating. Thus, I will, uh, I, uh, it is time to uh, say about the limit limits of decoupling. Mm. Uh, if I say the conclusion uh, in, in advance, the conclusion, the conclusion is that decoupling is not easy. And if possible, it happens very, very slowly over, over a very, very long period of time. I will explain the three forces uh, dictating, uh, dictating why. The three forces is that uh, locking effect and detour of value added export and uh, the importance of China's demand hub. First of all, the lock in effect. Uh, over the past 30 years or more, China has emerged as a supply hub in GVC for many industries, as the panel one, in the panel one, uh, you have explained very well. Uh, the, to summarize, the changes that took place in Asia during the, this period. Uh, China has emerged on behalf of Japan as a global supply chain hub in the region and uh, a demand hub in some uh, industries. Thus, uh, this uh, uh, very, uh, this not easy uh, uh, to relocate. Uh, uh, let's take an example of uh, uh, automobile industry, especially automobile part. Uh, export of automobiles, automobiles and parts in China uh, increased significantly from 0.8% uh, uh, in 2000, 2000s to 8.4% in 2018. And look at the structure of auto part imports from China to some uh, major countries. Uh, for example, uh, for Japan and Korea, the Chinese share of import is very, very high, uh, high. Uh, respectively, 36% uh, for Japan and about 30% for, for Korea. And even for the United States, it is uh, about 16% uh, next uh, second after, uh, after Mexico. And I take the, the example of Korea. The dependence on imports from China has greatly increased, particularly, particularly with regard to uh, cars. And in particular, the share of Chinese imports of electric and electronic devices and steering systems and vehicle bodies and such suspension is very, very high, as you, as you see uh, in, in this table. Uh, Thus, uh, relocating automotive, uh, autom automotive production basis uh, for Korean company 
to Southeast Asia is not easy. Um, even if possible, it will take a very, very long time. I'll take the, the next, uh, the, 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 the second forces uh, is the detour export of aided village. Uh, what I mean by this detour export uh, of, uh, of aided village. Uh, the dependence of dependence on China does not uh, decrease easily, despite the re, uh, relocation of some production base to Southeast Asia. Why? It is because the import of intermediary goods from China is increasing. For example, uh, the China's value added included in Vietnamese export to the uh, to the United States is increasing very rapidly. Uh, for example, the, the dependence of intermediate good import from China, uh, for example, the, uh, for the manufacturing industry as a whole, the share rose from 6% in 2005 to 17% in 2015. And uh, the share is about 20% for textile industry in 2020. And for motionary and electronic industry, it's uh, about 21 percent. Yes, you can you can see that for the Vietnam in the left uh, left figure, you can see the rising trend of the uh, Chinese share of uh, Chinese China's share uh, in value added in export to the USA, and the right figure is for uh, Taiwan. And the last, uh, the last policy is the importance of China as a demand hub. For example, new car sales in China in 2019 was 2.6 million units. It is 1.5 times that of uh, 17 million units in the United States. And we, and Volkswagen, Volkswagen sales in China in 2019 uh, amounted, amounted to two, uh, 4 million uh, units. It's, uh, it, it is, it's account for 38% uh, of Volkswagen's global sales. And 50% of world smartphone production is in China. What is imp wh why this is important? The, uh, it is because the related intermediate good market is to bound to be China. Yes, as you, in the left figure, you can, you can see the car sales in the US in the US, uh, uh, China, and uh, India. And in the, right, uh, in the right, you can see the number of uh, new smartphone contractors for China and the USA, US and India. Uh, and I think the role of demand hub is expected to, uh, to strengthen after the COVID-19. It is because the market difference in, in the COVID-19 response performance between uh, on, the other, on the one hand, China and East Asia, and, uh, uh, the, the, and the other regions, the regions of the world. And a large gap between China and China East Asia on the one hand, and the rest of the world will uh, arise in economic recovery and, and growth. This uh, enforces the uh, role of demand hub of East Asian uh, countries. Let's take, uh, let's talk about the Chinese U.S. China trade war too. It's the it's a war of a technology war, or as uh, in the first uh, in the first panel, uh, Professor Nero has emphasized very. Uh, much on this aspect, I, I share this. Uh, uh, the, I share here the Dr. Daru's uh, uh, mention. Thus, I will speak about China's strategy and the uh, US strategy and implication. Uh, as mentioned earlier, trade war focuses on high tech and strate strategically important. Uh, technologies and industries. Because I will explain high-tech strategies of China and US 
focusing on the aspect of competition between the two countries. In other words, in the uh, focusing on the geopolitical aspect of, of this of this issue. First of all, uh, uh, China's digital state capitalism and its over uh, ex expansion. Uh, I think China's strategy can be uh, summarized as uh, lowering its dependence on China on U.S. technology and establishing an independent supply chain and consolidating uh, digital uh, capitalism and its, its overseas expansion. As part of China's policy to, to lower its, its independence on technology and build its own uh, supply chain, um, we refer to the policy of improving the localization, localization rate and making technology independent. It is the core of the Made in China 2025 strategy since, 19, uh, since 2015. In addition, the, through the Smart Plus strategy and new infrastructure, uh, new infrastructure initiative, China is uh, continuing to implement policies to develop domestic uh, technologies in advanced fields such as 5G, AI, and big data, etc. Um, uh, co after COVID-19, President Xi Jinping proposed a double circulation strategy. Um, another, another strategy is to strengthen digital state capitalism and its overseas expansion. Uh, it seems that the Chinese government will try to make the most of digital technology to solidify the political system uh, against I think that this can, this could be called uh, a kind of digital state capitalism. And the new infrastructure initiative appears to be a declaration that it has set its direction for the digital uh, state capitalism. And uh, if I can interrupt you, uh, we're running out of time. So if you could just begin to, to wrap it up. Okay, yes. Uh, as part of this strategy, strategy uh, the Chinese government is promoting the expansion uh, of the digital. Uh, uh, as part of uh, uh, digital, uh, digital for the policy. Thus, I, uh, I will uh, explain some more more detail to tell uh, uh, this strategy. Thus, the Digital Silk Road Initiative is a plan to promote digital transformation of countries along the line uh, as part of the uh, uh, One Belt and One Road policy. Thus, uh, the, the goal is to promote the export of digital products and services and lead international standard, standardiz standardization of next general digital technologies. A uh, related project consists of three parts, digital infrastructure construction and digital service promotion and uh, uh, smart city, uh, city uh, construction. construction. Thus, the last one is combined uh, both strategies. And in addition to these uh, various policies, there is also a major policy to lead to international standardization of emerging technologies. The, the, what is the U.S. strategy uh, against this uh, China strategy? Uh, I can summarize this uh, as a decoupling and technology alliance strategy, and uh, especially uh, we emphasize the technology uh, technology alliance strategy. This, uh, of course, it is. Uh, very early to think about to say about the uh, uh, concrete strategy uh, in this in this field but i can find uh, several several reports from united states think tank for example uh, center for new american securities and uh, well, uh, information technology innovation foundation etc etc 
very menacing tank in USA uh, has proposed uh, a technology alliance in the technology field, in particular, for example, in the semiconductor field. Uh, we can see in this report the proposal that uh, say like that, like-minded uh, allied nations uh, can also advance their leadership collectively by uh, collaborating on technology and ecosystem development and intellectual property and uh, trade uh, liberalization. Thus, they propose uh, in their report uh, technology, technology alliance is technology alliance, but it is not only technology alliances, but also uh, uh, new architecture for international trade, uh, uh, international trade, uh, trade order. I think. The, I will skip this very rapidly. Uh, the third part. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Kim, uh, we can come back to some of this in the Q&A, please. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so we can uh, uh, move on like, to our next speaker. I think Dr. Kim has really uh, very nicely pointed out with a lot of evidence that uh, that sort of decoupling will be very, very hard from China. Uh, but he also raised uh, uh, an excellent point regarding China's quest for global, you know, leadership in the technological standards, and that's a very good segue <laughs> to our, our our next speaker. Uh, so, Mr. Ho, Ho will be uh, you, you were going to speak on on IPR and technology standards. So, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Let's see, I mean, I have no slides and my video, I don't know what's happened to it. Um, anyway, I'll just jump right in. Um, you're going to hear a theme through my comments that President-elect Biden uh, is going to be very different from the Trump administration. Uh, he's going to be more working with multi, with our friends and partners and allies looking for a multilateral approach uh, rather than unilateral. Um, and I think our, our trade partners will very much appreciate that. Um, President-elect Biden on standard setting um, clearly understands the importance uh, for technological innovation and market competitiveness, uh, especially in sectors such as telecommunications, AI, healthcare, et cetera. Um, we have seen that China's influence in standard setting has been increasing. Uh, for example, China has been playing a larger role in uh, standard setting organizations such as the ISO and IEC. Uh, for example, between 2011 and 2020, uh, we saw secretariat positions in the ISO's technical uh, or subcommittees uh, occupied by Chinese citizens increase by 73%. Uh, between 2012 and 2020, we saw secretariat positions um, uh, at the IEC increase uh, from, uh, with Chinese citizens uh, by 67%. Um, and this is particularly significant because uh, the IEC and the ISO combined produce around um, 85 percent of all international standards. Um, so they really play a key role. Um, you know, we've seen examples of China's standard settings, uh, their strategy with their digital Silk Road that's part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and we're expecting the Chinese um, Standardization Administration uh, to release the China Standards 2035 strategy this year, where we expect that they will be announcing their goals uh, in standard setting in next generation technologies like AI, 5G, IoT. Um, and as a result of China's rising influence, countries like Korea uh, will face threats to the international rules-based order. Um, and we're seeing that uh, Chinese companies are looking to be dominant players in next generation 
uh, technology sector. So these developments are expected to pose challenges for the new Biden administration. Um, in uh, Most recently in May 2020, Frank Rose at Brookings said, uh, U.S.-China competition is essentially about who will control global information, technology, infrastructure, and standards. Um, so analysts are expecting that uh, President-elect Biden and his team will continue um, the tough approach towards the China problem. However, as I mentioned, uh, it's expected to be done through cooperation with allies and partners uh, compared to the unilateral Trump approach. Um, the pre uh, President-elect Biden has said he will rebuild alliances and partnerships uh, and restore American credibility in, uh, by re-engaging in multilateral institutions. Um, so I think we can expect to see U.S. leadership in forums such as APEC, uh, G20, ASEAN, uh, the East Asia Summit, um, and the WTO for constructive standard setting in areas of technology. Um, another area to watch is um, uh, President Biden has mentioned he wants to host a summit for democracies. Uh, which may include topics on technology. Uh, and we're hearing that that summit is likely to uh, take place in the United States in June. Um, we think that these steps will be welcomed by many countries in Asia, like Korea and Japan. Um, Japan, which um, contributed mightily to international standards in the WTO, um, as well as uh, in CPTPP um, with the absence of the U.S. leadership there. Uh, we think that these changes are welcomed by uh, Korea as well, uh, as Korea has seen an increased digital interdependence uh, with Beijing. Um, while Korea, like most countries in Asia, are a little bit nervous about being caught in between the United States and China. Um, I think they all would appreciate a rules-based order uh, and the advancement of democratic values and norms on technology. Um, regarding intellectual property rights, I think we can expect uh, uh, that President-elect Biden is well aware that China uh, has failed to live up to their commitments. In fact, it was during the um, Obama presidency when um, Joe Biden was vice president when in 2015, the Chinese uh, committed to uh, that they would not conduct or knowingly support cyber enabled theft of intellectual property. Uh, and uh, it is the belief of uh, most policymakers, including our president elect, that China has not kept that promise. Um, so I think we're going to see the Biden team focus on IP protection uh, and force technology transfer to try to level the economic playing field while strengthening U.S. domestic innovation. Um, the Biden team will likely, um, uh, again, be looking to work with allies and partners. Um, Jake Sullivan, who ha is, has been named as um, President-elect Biden's National Security Advisor, uh, and Kirk Campbell, um, uh, who is likely to end up with a senior position uh, in the new administration, wrote an op-ed for Foreign Affairs in 2019 on China. And in it, um, what they said about IP was, the U.S. will also have to safeguard its technological advantages in the face of China's IP theft, targeted industrial policies, and co-mingling of its economic and security sectors. Uh, and they went on to say that doing so will require some enhanced restrictions on the flow of technology investment and trade in both directions, but that these efforts should be pursued selectively rather than wholesale, uh, imposing curbs on technologies that are crucial to a national security and human rights, while still allowing regular trade and investment to continue for those that are not directly related. 
Um, meanwhile, um, overreach on technology restrictions uh, could drive other countries toward China, especially since China is already uh, most everyone in Asia's number one trading partner. Um, they went on to suggest that the U.S. refrain from unilateral campaigns uh, followed by the Trump administration. Uh, they wrote, future efforts to restrict trade with China in the technology sector will require careful deliberation, advanced planning, and multilateral support if they are to be successful. Otherwise, they risk undermining U.S. innovation. So I think what um, that is a very good phrase is, uh, gives us a good roadmap for what we can expect for a Biden administration. Um, also, uh, it's very encouraged uh, to see that uh, Catherine Tai has been nominated as the U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, Catherine's parents are man are uh, from Taiwan, uh, and she Catherine is fluent in Mandarin and has negotiated. Uh, with the Chinese while she was at USTR in Mandarin. Uh, so we believe in the business community uh, and uh, I should note a bipartisan group uh, from um, Capitol Hill, members of Congress uh, have voiced strong support uh, for her nomination. I, I expect we will see bilateral and multilateral cooperation on IPR. Um, uh, we will work with like-minded like countries, including Korea, to promote high IP standards through um, the region, both bilaterally and uh, through multilateral fora. Uh, for example, as Biden works to strengthen the USROK alliance uh, and global partnership, I think we will see our two nations uh, work together to protect IP as both uh, South Korea and the United States both uh, foster their innovative industries. Um, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement serves as a very positive model for high standards on intellectual property rights, uh, and Korea has used that model uh, as a baseline for its other free trade agreements in the region. Um, Professor Nehru's comments at the beginning about of uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, uh, were spot on. Um, we believe that the single biggest attribute of this uh, mega regional trade deal is its single rule of origin, which will further allow deeper um, uh, supply chain integration in the region. Um, the U.S. and Korea will also continue to support IPR through multilateral platforms like the WTO, uh, APEC, and G20. Um, the other um, multilateral um, uh, regional agreement, uh, CPTPP, uh, that the U.S. was part of, but on day three, with no formal policy review, uh, President Trump withdrew the United States from that agreement. Um, we were delighted to see that uh, Japan, Australia, um, New Zealand, and Singapore were able to move forward and uh, get that agreement into force. Uh, that agreement has uh, also very high standards on IP uh, and lots of transparency around standards. Um, so it's an agreement that we think will um, help um, improve standards all across Asia. Um, and with that, um, I don't think President-elect Biden will move to rejoin CPTPP early in his administration. Um, he has indicated that uh, he will focus on domestic issues first, uh, but I think that um, Asia won't wait. Um, during the last four years, uh, many exciting things have happened in Asia. A lot of bilateral trade agreements, uh, plus CPTPP and RCEP, uh, and the U.S. really has very little to show. Uh, we have a small uh, phase one with China that is really a purchasing agreement, uh, and we have a limited um, phase one with Japan that is basically an agriculture agreement. 
Um, so uh, the rest of Asia has been moving on. It's very important that um, the new administration get us back into uh, Asia and recommit to our partners, our allies, and our friends there. Um, you know, South Korea has indicated that they have an interest. Um, President Moon uh, said on December 8th, uh, he may have an interest in joining CPTPP. China has also expressed their interest to join CPTPP. Uh, so I think um, we may see uh, the U.S. Uh, having to deal with that question sooner rather than later. But in the meantime, I think the, uh, the, the early approach the administration will take will be on small sectorial agreements, uh, like the U.S.-Japan Digital Trade Agreement uh, that went into force this year with higher standards on data flows uh, and other uh, digital trade issues uh, that could be expanded to um, include other countries. Uh, and with that, um, I'm just going to toss the baton back to the team and save some time and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's an excellent segue to our, our next speaker. Since underlying uh, the elephant in the room, in a sense, is what uh, Josh will have to have to deal with, which is the deeper underlying issues of international security and the growing co competition between China and the United States. Uh, where that is headed, how that might change under the Biden administration, and in turn, how might that affect all the economic issues that we've been, we've been discussing above, uh, Josh, you have to give us an answer to all of these. <laughs> That's a tall order at the end of a, a, a very rich uh, set of discussions we've had here. Um, I'll, I'll be brief. I wanted to highlight just a few things we may want to watch for over the coming months as the Biden administration uh, uh, Asia policy takes shape. Uh, you know, the, the first thing I would I would note by way of preface is that there's already been quite a lot of uh, hand wringing, both in Washington and I think across Asia, about uh, the the shape of the new administration's Asia policy, about uh, personnel decisions, and I really think it's it's too early to draw many conclusions about where the new administration will will land. Um, you know, it is it is pretty clear that the that the incoming team recognizes that uh, America's allies and partners in Asia do not want to simply hear about a China policy, uh, but want to hear about an Asia policy um, of which uh, uh, approach to China is a, a foundational and central, but merely one pillar of a wider way of engaging the, the region. And I think uh, the conversations already in this, um, uh, in this uh, discussion have um, have highlighted the way in which China is an important player, but but not the only one. But I, I will start off um, uh, to Professor Kapoor's question in talking about China. Uh, then I have a few comments about Northeast Asia and then a few unknowns that we may want to keep in mind. Um, there there is a lot to watch for on the the China front, um, and I want to I want to begin by uh, by noting some of the the things that that I'm watching for on the personnel and sort of uh, bureaucratic structure front. And Ms. Overby um, really nicely noted some of these. Uh, there have been some important announcements on, that will have bearing on Asia policy. Uh, Catherine Tai at, at USTR, which has been roundly welcomed. Um, Tony Blinken at State, who was in many ways um, for, for a, a considerable season, the Asia policy manager um, at the State Department when he was, uh, when he was deputy. Uh, I think it's, it's been very well received, uh, and he has, he has deep relationships and, and experience on Asia. Uh, there's been there's been consternation in some circles about the nomination of uh, Lloyd Austin to be Secretary of Defense because of his background, uh, um, most notably uh, in the Middle East. But I think we still want to watch uh, very carefully 
for the forthcoming appointments for Deputy Secretary of Defense and Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, uh, which will, I think, really set the tone for how the new administration um, is going to think about wider strategic planning uh, with respect to, uh, to Asia. The, um, the other two things that I think are really worth watching on the structural front are whether some of the uh, reports that we've heard about there being a, an, an Asia czar or an Asia policy um, a senior official in, uh, in the government at the White House or at the State Department, in fact, come to pass. Um, and I really think there is um, you know, a considerable logic and momentum to having someone in the senior position who can draw together uh, all of the different dimensions of, of what it takes to have a, a coherent approach to China, not uh, nest in a coherent approach to Asia. Uh, the final position, which is one of the few cabinet uh, positions that has not yet been announced, is Secretary of Commerce, which we often uh, think about in, its, in the United States and its role for promoting American business uh, abroad. But in the current context, it, um, in the, the developing relationship with China actually plays a very important role in a number of areas related to technology transfer and technology uh, security and standard setting uh, that are arguably uh, much more important for sh uh, shaping the sort of the direction of, um, of, of US policy toward China than the sort of business advocacy dimension. So there, there are there are issues related to sort of personnel and, and, and structure um, at probably the most you know sort of granular level, but we all know that policy um, that that personnel is policy uh, to a large extent. Um, the other thing that I, I'm looking at, uh, and I think we should all be watching for uh, as the China policy shapes up, is how the administration speaks about China. And here, I think we uh, would should not be surprised if we see that the new team is somewhat uncomfortable about adopting wholesale the rhetoric of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, already, I think we, we've heard a, a revised phrase, a, um, a prosperous and secure uh, Pacific. Um, but you know, the, I, the sort of the wider question is how the new team is going to frame competition with China. And even though I suspect there will be a great deal of continuity, uh, that there will be uh, very few voices who would want to return to um, to where we were four or, or eight years ago, um, recognizing that the uh, China's behavior is markedly different uh, today. We've learned lessons about how China has behaved um, on the world stage uh, that we, we do want to hear what that new discourse is. I think the challenge for the new team is to, uh, is to reassure partners uh, throughout the region that the United States uh, um, is not backing away from uh, um, uh, a recognition of uh, China's you know, often coercive behavior in the region, while also managing expectations about what the United States is uh, willing and able to do about it. Uh, from the perspective of, of the Defense Department, for example, uh, in the United States, there are very real trade-offs, particularly in a fiscally constrained environment, about investing in the kinds of activities that have high visibility for our friends, allies, and partners, uh, ship visits, cooperative activities, and the like, and investing in very high-end capabilities that we would use in a high-end contingency that involved uh, China um, in the Taiwan Strait or, or elsewhere. And so uh, I think it's all the more reason that I think the new team is going to be thinking not just about what they say by way of reassurance, but about not um, raising expectations too high about what the United States will uh, be able to do in the near term. You know, one other interesting uh, rhetorical or sort of discursive uh, choice that the new team will have to make is what to say about the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this was a, um, a, a term introduced by the Trump administration that I think has been generally uh, well received uh, and was a way of formalizing what had become an increasingly a broader U.S. government approach to Asia, uh, thinking about South Asia and East Asia not as entirely separate strategic or economic spheres, but as spheres which were increasingly integrated by China's um, Belt and Road Initiative, to be sure, uh, by the growing presence of the Chinese Navy in the Indian Ocean, by India's uh, Act uh, East um, uh, uh, approach 
but also by the in, by the sort of growing web of minilateral or plurilateral relationships that we've seen um, between countries in East Asia and countries in South Asia and uh, and beyond. Uh, I think there's a broad recognition of, by the new team that this is uh, the Asia that we now um, we now uh, see and need to engage. Um, uh, and we've seen some use of the Indo-Pacific term, but I think the, the nomenclature is still um, worth watching and, and a little bit up in the air. So if, if that's personnel and structure uh, and, uh, and rhetoric, of course, the thing we're all most interested in are the policy decisions that will face the, the Biden administration. Uh, and we've already heard about some of this uh, on technology and trade. Um, in the defense and strategic space, I, I have to think that one of the most interesting tensions to watch is uh, between those who um, are, uh, for many good reasons, uh, more hawkish on China in wanting to focus U.S. investments, uh, capabilities, and high-level attention on facing a, a growing strategic challenge um, in the Western Pacific and, and beyond. Um, and on the other side, those who are worried about crafting a, with a discourse and a policy that is too heavily focused on uh, competition or an adversarial frame with China. And I think in, in that camp, there are those who worry that that would be a difficult uh, sort of single focus to sell to the American people uh, who are struggling in the midst of a of a pandemic and uh, economic challenges on the home front. Uh, but also I think in that latter camp are those who take very seriously the threat of climate change and see it as a, really one of the, the most uh, clear cut priorities that the, uh, the Biden and Harris team have put forward uh, and recognizing that uh, there, there's really no choice but to engage China uh, in, a, in a serious and constructive way uh, if we are going to um, to get, in an aggregate sense, back on track toward the the goals agreed at Paris, so there, there, I think there will be be tension among these these two camps, um, and you know, as was um, mentioned earlier, J Jake Sullivan, who's the the new national security advisor, uh, he was one of a, a number of uh, of people who participated in a, in a really interesting study that the Carnegie Endowment did. Uh, looking at the connection between U.S. foreign policy and the the American middle class, and they traveled to countries uh, to, to to states in the United States um, and talked with Americans about how they see foreign policy. And I think really one there were a number of interesting conclusions that came out of this, but uh, but one was just how challenging um, and really artificial it would be to try to drive Americans to uh, in a fear-based way to see China as an overpowering new threat that needs to be pursued with single-minded um, uh, kind of efforts, and that there needs to be a, sort of a, a balanced approach that thinks about how ordinary Americans ex experience things that matter to them. Um, and at the same time, the United States should maybe direct some dollars from the defense budget into R&D, uh, focus on, on things that, um, that could have a very high impact in the future, like critical supply chains, um, in mitigating the risks of sort of larger downside shock. So I would not be surprised if, if, that, um, if that approach really gains, gains currency. Um, you know, I, I could speak maybe in the Q&A about some more uh, defense specific issues uh, that are top of mind for, uh, for officials who are probably going to be taking up these por portfolios in, in the Biden administration. But, but, the, but there are a few things that, that I'll really be watching for. And one is, uh, in the first year or two, uh, is the administration reasonably going to be able to redirect resources from the Middle East to Asia? This is a, a, has been a perennial challenge in converting very uh, lofty rhetoric about pivoting or rebalancing or refocusing on Asia to uh, actual investments um, in uh, defense capabilities, defense presence, security cooperation, and then of course, more broadly thinking about, um, uh, thinking about uh, helping our partners in, and friends in the region uh, not be subject to, uh, to attempts by China to, to coerce them economically, uh, politically, or militarily. 
Um, and the final thing I'll say on the, on the defense front, and happy to go into a lot more detail, is that I do think the new team is likely to uh, undertake a wider review of U.S. posture in Asia. This is in some ways uh, overdue. It's been about 10 years since there was a, a really sort of deep dive within the department looking at posture. Um, I, I don't expect any any major changes, but I would expect <clears throat> broader continuity in um, a continued uh, reorientation away from large, static, relatively vulnerable bases to a more dispersed and resilient posture uh, across the, the, the region. Um, a little bit less applicable to, to, to Northeast Asia than elsewhere, but I think that's, that's certainly something we're gonna be watching uh, very closely. Um, so if, if that's the uh, China policy, just a, a, couple, a couple more brief uh, areas of interest. One, of course, is U.S. Uh, strategy and policy uh, in Northeast Asia. Uh, I think the priority of the, of the new team, quite rightly, is going to be to try to uh, repair and restore and revitalize uh, U.S. relationships with allies and partners that have, uh, that have been stressed and that have in some cases atrophied over the last four years. Uh, some of the tensions, of course, are, are well known, tensions over negotiations over um, on uh, defense burden sharing, uh, on trade, on how to approach North Korea, on China. Um, I, I don't think the, the Biden team is likely to see eye to eye with our, um, uh, with our Korean and Japanese friends on, on all of these issues. But I think they're all, uh, this will be the sort of early focus of, of the team and their engagement. Um, on North Korea, uh, again, I, you know, the, the incoming team has been, uh, I think, uh, relatively clear that, uh, and, and the, the president-elect certainly over, over a long period has been clear that he's, he's open to talks with North Korea, but is concerned about giving away something for nothing. Um, and this will continue to be a, a, a challenge. I, I do think there's a very realistic expectation by those who are, um, who are coming into the administration that North Korea has a, a history and a propensity to try to, uh, to get attention early in an administration uh, with, with missile tests or other things, um, and that you know, they are uh, prepared to, to engage that, but not to let it uh, derail the wider set of priorities that the team has, has announced. Um, and, and finally, on the, on the sort of Northeast Asia uh, strategic front, I do think that uh, the new administration is likely to be more proactive, uh, more engaged, um, and a bit more vigorous in trying to, to mitigate some of the uh, tensions and, and dare I say, um, uh, dysfunctions and, and uh, historical um, uh, uh, animosities that have gotten in the way of uh, the co uh, bilateral cooperation between Japan and Korea and uh, trilateral cooperation in, in Northeast Asia. My, my final point is I know that we, we don't have a lot of time uh, is just to say there are a lot of unknowns that are uh, that, could, that could really change the shape of, um, of what the new administration's policy looks like in Asia over the next over the next year. And just to, to name a few, I mean as Dr. Um, Matu really highlighted well, uh, it is quite, a, and, and Professor Kapoor as well, it is quite a puzzle why China has uh, in such a, a stark way, uh, almost gone out of its way to alienate uh, countries that could have been, if, if not friends, at least constructive partners. I mean, we've seen this very dramatically with India and with Australia, but certainly Korea has its uh, has had its own experience with Chinese economic coercion. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen from China a, a really uh, new and disturbing kind of belligerent rhetoric. Um, this seems highly counterproductive. Uh, it, it, it may continue or it may not, but I think if, if it does continue, it could really accelerate some of the, some of the, of the trends we've talked about today, which as many of the speakers have said, you know, supply chains uh, shift slowly. Um, uh, China's actions in, in recent years have in many ways sort of unnaturally accelerated those and have driven balancing behavior by, by many countries in the region. Um, you know, uh, there are, are other possible uh, unknowns, um, you know, uh, U.S. fiscal policies, um, uh, you know, at the, 
at the pivot from one administration to, to the next, we, uh, we all expect that this is the moment when Republicans who have been freely spending for the last four years will quickly pivot to the politics of austerity, um, maybe not on defense, but I expect that it, it will affect defense. Uh, it will also affect more broadly the United States' ability to, um, to engage uh, partners and prospective partners in Asia through infrastructure finance and diplomatic engagement and a, a whole range of, of issues. Um, and then finally, uh, I think we, we all know that there is uh, always lurking the, the risk of a, uh, a crisis on the, on the peninsula or a, a crisis with Taiwan, which would uh, draw in the, the United States in, um, in unexpected ways um, and uh, sort of change the, the focus of U.S. attention and, and U.S. Uh, US um, uh, engagement in, in the region. Uh, so all that to, to say, uh, I think most of us are watching most, most carefully for the, the signs that indicate how the new team will talk about China, uh, which sectors they want to focus on, and how they're going to balance the kind of geo-strategic imperative with the, the imperative to engage China on climate change. But there are these host of other challenges that, uh, that will be worth watching as well. Uh, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Josh. Uh, uh, if our other panelists can c come on the screen, uh, uh, that would be great. Uh, so one thing that I'll sort of begin this with, 20 years ago when China joined the WTO, so roughly, no one could have predicted where China would be today. Yet in some ways, as we think of the next 20 years, we, I somehow got a sense from our entire discussions that as if the trends we see now, you know, that's going to be there 20 years down the road. If you think about the last 20 years after China joined the WTO, you had 9-11, you had the Iraq war, you had uh, the global financial crisis, and of course the pandemic, uh, whatever you want to call it, once in a decade, once a century events, now you have every few years. So it's very clear, or it's pretty clear that there are some known knowns. We know that China is going to go through a very rapid demographic transition in the next 20 years. It's going to be equally or on a scale as much as Japan. Korea is going through that. And we know that has massive implications for economic structures and et cetera. We would not have thought what has China has done to Hong Kong this year, that that would have happened, you know, <laughs> you know three to four years. So what I want to ask the panelists is, what do you think are the biggest risks in the next five to 10 years. Can we see what China did to Hong Kong uh, acting like that towards to Taiwan? If so, what are the implications? Uh, do we see the way China's thing with Australia and India? What are the broader ramifications? Because both countries were avoiding joining the Quad. It's very clear the Quad has got a lot of oxygen precisely because of China's actions. So what are the risks that you think? Things that we generally, you know, those low probability but high impact events that could sort of change the more optimistic scenarios that were laid out in the first panel. Hey, any of you? Um, I'll jump in. I, I think um, the one event, and it is, I think, low probability, uh, but it would be that the commun that Xi Jinping loses control of the Communist Party and the people, uh, the Chinese people stand up and uh, start crying for democracy. Uh, Dr. Kim? Yes, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Obi. I, uh, 
uh, if I compare the Chinese regime and Chinese economic development and uh, the experience of the Soviet Union, uh, it is very uh, interesting to, to compare this, uh, these two experiences. The, uh, the, the collapse, the collapse of the China, uh, Soviet regime is not because of the external threat. Uh, but, uh, since, since the end of the 1960s, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Soviet economy has begun in the period of stagnation. And the crisis is deepening, is deepening, deepening from, from this moment until the end of the, uh, and until the end of the system. The, the important thing is the, uh, the possibility of a reform from, inter from, from within, I think. In this perspective, I think uh, the Chinese regime is uh, some different from uh, 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 the Soviet regime. It is more flexible and it is more decentralized. And ideolo the, the most important thing is the ideological flexibility in contrast to the Soviet regime. For example, the, about about the, the attitude to the uh, uh, market economy, for example, and the opening to the international international system. So it's, I don't know, I don't know, but uh, uh, if I compare with the Soviet uh, experience, uh, I think it is not. Uh, 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 this is not improbable, but but it is very difficult to. Uh, to see to or to predict the the, the same uh, con the, the same consequences uh, uh, with the uh, Soviet uh, Soviet experience. Thus, uh, yes, of course, the major uh, major risk is from within the possibility of uh, uh, reform, political re uh, political reform. But I think, in compare with the Soviet regime. It is more flexible and more adaptable to the environment, uh, external environment, I think. So Dr. Kim, if I, I understood I, you, oh. you, sorry, George, still just one sec. Uh, so she was saying, if I understood you, that you also share uh, Ms. Oberby's concerns that the risks are internal to China, but you think that they are more manageable. Yes, yes. Uh, Josh? Yeah, I, you know, I, I would approach the question from a, a somewhat different angle from the defense and security side. There was a, a very interesting foreign affairs piece today by Michael Beckley and Hal Brand, um, which, you know, said in summary, look, many people look at, at China uh, and they frame it as a, as a generational challenge. And, and you can look at power transitions and see it in that way. But another way to look at it is, uh, is that these transitions are particularly uh, tricky, um, uh, you know, uh, during times like this, when China is, does not feel assured that it will continue to rise, right? When it is feeling um, and uh, demographic stress and economic stress and internal political pressure. And that at moments like this, you know, the United States should be thinking about what are the key challenges um, in which we could lose an edge in the next 10 years. Uh, and the authors identify two, which I think are salient. One is the, really the military balance of power across the, the Taiwan Strait in the next 10 years. Uh, this is a, you know, it's, it's eroding and uh, for a whole host of, of reasons which can be addressed, but not without serious attention and trade-offs. Uh, and the other they ad they address are um, the ways in which uh, China and other countries shape the environment for uh, 5G and other other technologies. Right? Um, you know, you could you could expand that uh, to other defense areas, perhaps. And there's a lot of competition in cyber and counter space technologies, um, you know, drone technologies and, and other things that uh, if the United States falls behind in the coming 10 years, it doesn't mean that we have lost anything, but it might mean that we have, uh, we have lost an edge that, that could be consequential if China
China continues to grow and invest as it has. So I think it's less about saying here's what the tra trajectory of China will be, but what are some of the critical areas where uh, capability gaps could, uh, uh, could really diverge in troubling ways for us and our partners and allies over the next 10 years, unless we pay particular attention. And I thought that that framing is, is helpful because it's a way of thinking about key sectors or areas where, uh, where collaboration with key partners um, on R&D uh, and other things could be particularly important over the next decade. This is a question for all of you, but also our colleagues like from the first panel. I mean, what is striking is in the next 20 years is just the degree of demographic change occurring in Northeast Asia, including China, Korea, Japan. We are for the first time going to be faced with a situation we have not seen for hundreds of years, which is the demographic you know, decline. And of course, massive increases in the dependency ratio. How is that likely to shape places of like production and consumption and through that, you know, the value chains. It's bound to change because we know that the demographics of change of that magnitude cannot but have large economic impacts and therefore the impacts on output and trade. And I'm wondering if, if Vikram or Haditya or Dr. Lim, you have any thought, thoughts on that? Well, I may be an outlier in this regard, and let me take an extreme position. Um, where you I have no less. Sorry? I would expect no less. <laughs> right. I mean, this, the, 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 this point about uh, demographic change leading to a slowdown in China's growth is obviously based on the assumption that you have a declining labor force, right? And that will... Uh, 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 mean that uh, its contribution to the growth rate will, will decline. If you look at the history of the last 20 to 30 years, growth in China's labor force has contributed something like 0 0.3 percentage points to its growth rate. It's been very, very little. The I'm really surprised you say that because I've seen very different. The biggest contributions are increases in the capital labor ratio and increases in TFP growth. So where, I mean, where you have countries that are relatively well within the technology. No, frontier, the so where you have countries that are well within the technology frontier, right? And you have the high savings rates that China continues to have. You could continue to have productivity growth that will compensate or the decline in the labor force. In other words, labor productivity will rise faster than the decline of the labor force. Yes, the growth rate may slow, but not slow to the point where it becomes an issue. Um, having said that, I think the bigger constraint, in my view, is that China is very rapidly approaching the technology frontier. And that is a more powerful uh, force in slowing China's growth, in my, in my estimation. It has already reached the technology frontier in a range of sectors, uh, um, but it is still within the technology frontier in, in, in other sectors. So there continues to be room for some productivity growth, especially I think as uh, Aditya mentioned <clears throat> in, in services where it has substantial room for improvement. So I don't think the forces of the growth are necessarily gonna dry up that soon. And I don't, this is my extreme position. I don't believe democracy is gonna play that big a role. Aditya, over to you. What do you think? Uh, uh, thank you, Devesh Vikram. I think, uh, uh, Vikram, I agree with you about the macro points that you're making, but I do uh, feel that the main uh, issue that Devesh has raised about the increasing dependency ratio does raise challenges for China. You know, the whole question of the whole pension system and this, uh, certain, uh, dealing with uh, the whole social protection issues are going to be hugely magnified for China in a way that it hasn't really 
uh, anticipated. But if I can make a slightly different point, which is, I think, more directly related to the vicious question about what it means for trade and value chains. <coughs> I think the changing demographic structure changes the structure of comparative advantage because it definitely will contribute to the increasing real wage in China. I think, Vikram, you're right. If there is sufficient TFP growth and if there is technological innovation, then the fact that what we've already seen, we will see some increasing automation, but it also changed the structure of demand in China. It is already happening. I think the demand for, uh, we've looked at the, composition of the elderly in China and how it compares, or the expenditure of the elderly. The elderly spend more on <clears throat> healthcare, on financial services. The young spend more on entertainment and uh, education. I think so both on the supply side, there is a shift in comparative advantage away from highly labor intensive activities. And on the demand side, there is going to be a huge increase in demand for specific services. Now, it might be that digitization and the scope for long-term delivery will lead to a remarkable growth in services value chains, which need, uh, equip <clears throat> China to, in a way, perform international demographic arbitrage. And so we will see an emergence of a new class because, you know, health value chains, education value chains, they haven't really developed. There is still a degree of indivisibility in services. So I see that as an important thing, but I also see that, you know, I mentioned this race between the price of the rob robot falling and the real wage in China increasing, that there is likely to be a significant shift in basic manufacturing activity, first towards China's landlocked interior, and then subsequently towards the rest of the world. If I may just add one more thing, Devesh. Just so because, uh, let's give like Dr. Lim a chance. Oh, go ahead. Dr. Lim, uh, because yes, you... Um, uh, Vikram... This please, is happening uh, in sort of, yeah, Korea. Yeah. Korea has been witnessing a very sharp decline in infertility and so on. Right, right. How do you, how do you see the Korean experience because of its demographic changes, you know, going forward? Yeah, I mean... Uh, Vikram gave a sort of a growth accounting perspective and uh, Aditya uh, gave sort of a GBC perspective on um, demographics. But what I'd like to highlight is actually a sort of social and political perspective on this because uh, this sort of increasing uh, generational tension, intergenerational tension in Korea, um, given its seniority based wages, and uh, the prospect of increased burden on the part of uh, younger people supporting older people while uh, jobs are not as uh, plentiful, as, uh, as abundant as before for younger people. So, so the uh, real risk I see is actually on that you know, political economy side rather than uh, GBC or uh, growth accounting because as uh, Vikram highlighted, uh, if you also look at Korea's uh, 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 growth trends, um, you know, TFP growth has been, you know, fairly respectable. Uh, labor contribution has been minimal, really, um, similar, to, uh, similar to China. And depending on how Korea could upgrade uh, its knowledge base and skills and build uh, regional and global value chains, I don't see why it would be impossible for Korea to uh, thrive uh, using that kind of strategy. But internally, given the uh, increased um, burden for supporting the old, especially if older people, you know, refuse to say, uh, uh, say, accept uh, pension reform, um, uh, uh, lengthen uh, retirement age, and so on then that will be a problem. So, so that's the way I look at it. So does, does uh, Japan's trajectory offer any insights for Korea and China? Because that's the country where aging began. Right, right. right. But, but in Japan's case, there, not only was there a big demographic you know, uh, aging, uh, but there was a huge bubble, asset bubble to start with. And Korea, for the most part, has been able to avoid uh, 
inflating that kind of uh, asset bubble. And I think that has made a big difference. If you actually look at demographic trends, Korea is following Japan with a 20 year lag um, in terms of aging and everything. But uh, as far as uh, macroeconomic trends are concerned, it seems quite different, at least so far. So. Sorry, Vikram, you wanted to add? Well, just two points. One of the Japan question, Devesh, um, you know, Japan grew rich before it grew old. And so in other words, it approached, the, it was already approaching the technology frontier by the time its democratic sh demographic shift was taking place. So it's difficult to disentangle. My submission would be this combination of what Professor Lim has just mentioned, uh, the, the, the crisis, but also in addition, the fact that it had approached the technology frontier that led to a slowing of growth. In China, it's a very different question. One of the things in China that is worth emphasizing is that China actually continues to be a relatively inefficient economy in many respects, right? It's I-core, it's in in incremental capital output ratio is close to seven, right? It's, it's one of the higher uh, I-cores in the world. It has uh, this problem about labor reallocation, that is uh, labor is, is, is unable to move from city to city because they can't there's no portable pensions, there's no portable social protection, et cetera. So that leads to a relatively inefficient allocation of labor. So if you have a declining labor force and the savings in the economy are used well, in fact, two things will happen. A, you will continue with relatively high productivity, but the other is that you will actually start beginning to reduce the balance payments current account surplus because uh, 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 the savings that would otherwise be sort of available for use abroad can now be used at home to more to to greater effect. So, Aditya, when the structure of consumption changes because of an aging society towards things like healthcare, those are largely non-tradable services, right? So, so wouldn't that affect? Uh, as the, as aging occurs, the structure of consumption shifts away from tradables to more non-tradables? Devesh, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I, I would have said you are right, but... Uh... Sorry, Haditya, you are... Uh... Frozen. <laughs> If, uh, if yes. I could, please. Uh, uh, if I could, uh, may I address a different uh, topic that uh, Josh and Aditya uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the, the puzzle about Chinese uh, behavior? Right. Uh, because the way I understand it is, is goes like this: you know, uh, China uh, is a you know proud civilization, suffered a uh, century of uh, humiliation but have been, I mean, uh, in their view, they have been supporting regional and global growth, right? As uh, a factory for the world and a huge uh, market for the world. Uh, and there's a sense uh, that they like to uh, uh, try this somewhat risky strategy to see how uh, countries uh, will react and, uh, uh, as a result, China may be able to constrain their behavior in the following sense. Uh, for, for example, uh, Korea, as uh, someone mentioned, uh, you know, deployed a THAAD uh, missile system. And uh, China made the argument that uh, this missile system was not aimed at North Korea, but rather at China. And I think that was a fair, uh, fair argument and uh, was greatly upset about the uh, security impl implications of this uh, deployment. So they retaliated with uh, you know, uh, tourist visits to uh, Korea, uh, car sales, uh, Korean car sales in uh, China and so on. And that did have an impact on uh, Korea in that it really drove home the point that uh, China is serious about the security, uh, security uh, issue. Right? For Australia, for instance, uh, even though, as uh, Josh mentioned, uh, Australia has uh, benefited uh, greatly uh, from trade with uh, China, 
you know, uh, uh, Australia uh, has, uh, has joined the uh, Quad, right? And also has, uh, its, uh, its prime minister asked about the, uh, you know, asked for the international inquiry into the origin of uh, COVID-19. Now, uh, after the outbreak of the global financial crisis in uh, 2008, you didn't see an Australian prime minister saying we, we need to look at uh, the uh, origins of subprime mortgage crisis uh, in the United States or whatever, right? So from Chinese perspective, it seems like um, even though there are risks uh, to their strategy too, it may be uh, worthwhile to uh, lash out at Australia at this point and see uh, how they behave. And I, I think along the same line uh, with regard to China's uh, uh, behavior toward India these days as well. I mean, you know, you, uh, you, you could argue that uh, India uh, traditionally has been hedging, you know, between the Soviet Union, the US and uh, United States and China and so on. So it's not really a wise strategy to have this kind of a uh, border uh, problem with uh, India and actually inflame uh, anti-Chinese sentiments in India. But from Chinese perspective, it seems like this is, you know, about an opportune moment to uh, lash out at India and try to constrain their behavior uh, reg with regard to uh, China containment. But I, I don't know, but uh, that, that's my take. Because it's yeah. getting late. But I think at some point, China playing the victim card and everyone else is the country that is being, you know, trying, needs to be brought to line. Well, that's what an imperialist power does, right? Uh, but because, I, I because think, what is the notion of right. imperialism other than saying my way or the highway? But it's not, it, it's not just that because Chinese are basically saying we are, pro uh, we are providing an important uh, part of economic prosperity for the region and the globe. And on the security front, there's a disconnect, uh, you know, with regard to uh, the, uh, with regard to what's going on economically. And they want to lash out uh, to see how countries will react to that. So it's not uh, it's different from sort of an uh, imperial saying, it's my way or... Well, know. it depends, Dr. Lim, on which side you are looking at this from. But I think it's an excellent idea to make this the topic of, of our next years. Because it's late. Uh, Again, Chinese uh, speakers. Uh, yes. And, and it's late. And I know we've abused, uh, we've got people staying and the staff of SAIS, the information technology staff, we have kept them awake way beyond, you know. So I just want to thank everyone uh, on behalf of Dr. Lim, myself, and all of you for a very, you know, stimulating uh, uh, conversation. Dr. Lim, any last words? No, no, this has been a wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, thank uh, you, know, very late hours here and you know, just before, uh, just before lunch uh, in Korea and India and so on. So, yeah. thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ogilvy. Uh, thanks, Josh, and all of you for taking part. And we look forward to doing something like this next year. To Dr. Kim. Good. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Good, good, good night.